Start signing up for these guys. Mm-hmm. Buenas tardes, Lorenzo. ¿Cómo estás? Hey, Amanda. How are you? Hi, how are you? Oh, the snacks are awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Where are they? You go to that you? All the way to the water uh, bottle. I haven't gone yet. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Oh wow! It's got apples. Oh. Oh, it's a this. Oh wow! Then the is is this from all of you? Is it? And then we got this. No. Can you tell me what it says? I mean, I could probably. It's a. Oh. Also connects with my job and a big way. Yeah. I would have preferred to have done that one. For a day. You know, you get to a point in your life where you just like you don't like to really travel anymore either. Well, and it gets old real fast. Doesn't it? Oh, did you? I didn't realize you had worked with them. Yeah. Yeah. He did. Going to a hotel, even at a, at a restaurant, it just gets old. No. Yep. New York. Yeah, it's worth checking out. They do good conferences as well. They do nicely. It's only two days. Maybe I'll swing it and try to go to that one. Okay. How are you? I'm doing good. Huh? Good. How are you? Deep breaths. We're good. Oh, we're good. We're good. <laughs> We have a stack of like you, papers. you mean thousands of pages? We have thousands of pages. <laughs> when I looked at about nine o'clock last night, it was at one thousand eighty one that I had read. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I like your email though. It was a little incoherent because I was upset. No, I I I, 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 I was a bit in the same language. Okay, good. I was incoherent. I need to. Do you see Jerry? I noticed we were having a Can you point him up to us? Do you see my friend? Jerry, who? I'm not sure I know him. Remember, he was at our meeting. Um, he was a president of the Commission. Oh, do you see him? Is he an older gentleman with white oh, hair? Where is he? Hi. Right. I think that's him. Where? Uganda. Uganda. I'm not sure. The Disney voices. The Disney voices. Not watch our Facebook presentation last night. 
I've come a long way, baby. <laughs> did bring the snacks to them? No. Yeah, they did. So she said they're right there. Did you get some? Yeah. They've got to pay your dues. I, <laughs> I think we need to. I, just I don't think it's sandwich. enough. I don't think it's I enough. I need a sandwich right before, so I'm good. You think you should take care of me? Hey, do either one of you have uh, ibuprofen? Or? Yes, I am. I usually carry them. No, I don't. Or I bet you they are to watch you eat the grapes, you are not to share the grapes. You okay? Yeah, well, Kathy. Kathy, yeah, I bet you she, she does. Well, Kathy well, has everything. Any uh, ibuprofen <laughs> or aspirin? <laughs> What's the matter? You okay? What's the matter? <laughs> all right, we have an interpreter. <laughs> From all the reading. It's going to be a really good cool <laughs> idea. You should, you should be on the stand side there and I'll just. It's an inversion. You go, you went to get her then. It's really an inversion. Where was she at? But in this time, I promised to do it right. I don't either. It's rare. Read the entire script. When I do it, it's not a good thing because they're very painful. <laughs> Last time I did it, no, no, not usually. No. I went. Oh, there was a second page. <laughs> I'm just warm today. Chlorine, huh? Very warm. Okay. I'd like to call to order the uh, uh, Board of Education meeting for whatever day this is. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll get there eventually. Uh, I have an interpreter here who would like to say a few words before we start. Sí, buenas noches. Si alguien necesita traducción al español, levante la mano y les puedo alcanzar un auricular. Gracias. Thank you, Sandra. And I have a, a young lady here who is going to help us with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I can't remember exactly how to say her name, but she's going to come up to the thing and help us with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you all stand for that, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Puro puro prioridad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de America y la república que representa una nación bajo Dios indivisible con libertad y justicia para todos. Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. I'd like a, a moment of silence, and uh, uh, of course, our normal is in honor of the APS graduates who have lost their lives in serving the country, but I'd also like to have a, a moment of silence in honor of, uh, of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, where uh, 17 students lost their lives, and there were many others who were injured. So if you could have a moment of silence, please.
Thank you. We have a roll call, please. Yolanda Montoya Cordova. Here. Peggy Mueller Aragon. Here. Lorenzo Garcia. Here. Barbara Peterson. Here. Candelaria Patterson. Here. Elizabeth Armijo. Here. Dr. David Piercy. Here. Uh, before we adopt the agenda, I'd like to remove uh, item uh, 6.G and 6.F. 6.G is uh, just the board discussion on the uh, New Mexico School Board Association. We'll have that on Monday at our special meeting. And, uh, and 6.F, we do not have the information on that yet, so we're going to defer that. So with those changes, I'll entertain a motion for the adoption of the agenda and approval of the February 7th uh, meeting minutes. So move. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. Uh, and I'll move to recognition of uh, student, staff, and community. Uh, board member Montoya Cordova. All right. Well, welcome to tonight's board meeting, and thank you for coming. Our first recognition will be introduced by Yvonne Garcia, Assistant Superintendent for Zone 3. Good evening. I am excited to be here this evening. And after that agenda, I hope you have coffee. Tonight, I have the honor of recognizing several Spelling Bee winners and a few extraordinary volunteers. Recently, more than 40 students from middle and elementary schools from across the district participated in the competition after winning a, co a prior competition at their school. Six students won this district Spelling Bee and will participate in the state Spelling Bee next month. Several of the students were able to join us tonight, including Miss Evelyn Pignon, who won the championship by correctly spelling the word Schloss. Mm. And I'm guessing we all don't know what Schloss means, so I'm going to tell you. It is a German castle. In addition, the judges and pronouncer who helped with the spelling bee were also able to join us today. So as I call your name, please come forward to the podium. The judges, Laura Valdez, instructional manager for secondary summer learning with CNI. Lauren McConnell, development manager with APS Education Foundation. Dr. Joseph Escovedo, director of charter schools. And our pronouncer was Barbara Peterson, APS board member, District 4. Yay. Our first place winner, Evelyn Pignon, eighth grade student at Tony Hillerman Middle School. <laughs> our second place winner, Braden Diaz, sixth grade student at Cleveland Middle School. Third place winner, Phoebe Witt, student at Bandelier Elementary School. There's Bryn. Fourth place winner, Drew Grandy, student at North Star Elementary School. And we have a tie for fifth place. One of our fifth place winners is Seth Bryant, who's a student at Desert Ridge Middle School. <laughs> Tied with Samantha Salever, student at Ventana Ranch Elementary School. <laughs> with the family members supporting our students and judges and the pronouncer, please stand so that we can greet you. Thank you for being part of our spelling district spelling bee. And there's a lot of folks who would like to shake your hand. So if you'll just kind of walk this way. <laughs> Good job, guys.
S C H L O S S. Well, they don't like they don't give you the list of words until right then. And I'm pretty good at figuring things out from dictionary spellings, but uh, not when it's first. Our next recognition will be introduced by Scott Elder, Chief Operations Officer. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dr. Piercy, members of the board. Tonight I have the honor of recognizing several exceptional staff members. Ms. Sandy Kemp, Executive Director of Food and Nutrition Services, read that the APS Clothing Bank was concerned about being able to get items out to students. Sandy quickly volunteered the APS Food and Nutrition Services trucks and drivers to assist. Mm -hmm. Due to the work of Food and Nutrition Services, as we call them fans, the donations were picked up and distributed to the people in need of them. Several of the staff who helped to make this happen were able to join us this evening. As I call your name, will you please come up to the podium? Sandy Kemp. David Zamora. And Antonia Sor Antonio Soria. I'd also like to ask the family members and staff supporting these kind-hearted people, please stand so we can greet you. I'd, I'd just like to thank you all for stepping up and helping another department in need and let us show our appreciation for these guests one more time. Our next recognition will be introduced by Dr. Chris Muir, Executive Director of Student, Family, and Community Supports. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Piercy, members of the board, Superintendent Reedy, tonight I have uh, the honor of recognizing several outstanding community partners and some APS staff members. For 28 years now, KOAT Channel 7, Albuquerque, has provided warm winter coats to thousands of our students in need across northern and central New Mexico. The Coats for Kids campaign began when station manager Mary Lynn Roper be, wanted to provide children with warm winter jackets. What began as a few donated used coats has grown into a large campaign collecting and distributing more than 10,000 coats across a very large part of the state. The Albuquerque Community Clothing Bank is heavily dependent upon our community partners to provide the items our students require to be in school and ready to learn. Because APS is the largest district in the state in, and in their viewing area, we have benefited greatly from this effort over the years. This year, the clothing bank distributed more than 1,330 coats to 79 schools and programs in APS. And we are still counting. So they're not all out there yet. It's a cold day today, so we're gonna try to get the rest of them out. <laughs> Coat sizes given to students have ranged from four toddler to four XL adult. 
In addition to coats, KOAT gives APS the lighter jackets, hats, gloves, and scarves and vests that they collect. These items are distributed through the clothing bank to students to bridge the colder months in the fall and the spring. Members of Material Management Warehouse, our warehouse, and several key volunteers for the KOAT Coats for Kids drive have worked tirelessly each year to determine the best way to package and deliver coats to APS. In an operation lovingly called Coat Magden, the team boxes coats on pellets that, they can, that can be easily loaded onto trucks and transported to warehouse site at Lincoln Complex. Once at Lincoln, their, vest, their, their valet room, you've all seen the valet room at Lincoln, <laughs> is used to distribute coats out to schools. What once took weeks now takes a couple of days to have coats available for distribution to APS schools and programs. What keeps the program going after 28 years? The need. Our community still has that need. It's not going away. So we really value this partnership. The stories of the children who receive the coats make the program come alive. And I'm gonna to try to get through this story. So during one of the giveaway events, a young child asked Mary Lynn if he could save the tag from his coat that he had been given, and she asked him why. And he responded that he had never, ever owned anything new before. And he wanted to save that tag so he would remember. Wow. Thank you, Mary Lynn. So I wanna thank Mary Lynn and all the people at KOAT and our people in APS that made this happen. Without the key partnerships, the APS Community Clothing Bank could never dream of providing the number of warm winter coats that this partnership provides for our students. Several of these key um, partners are here today for, and I want them to join me. Be, and one of the people that's not on this list I'm actually gonna ask to come up and that is Elizabeth Calhoun. Could you please join me at the podium? Elizabeth is our manager for special projects and also oversees the clothing bank. And um, I've been told many times that this is the most organized it has ever been with the coats for kids. And that is a thanks to Elizabeth Calhoun. I put all kinds of organized people around me so I look good. So I wanted to especially thank Elizabeth for all of her work that she's done to pull these partners together. So as I call your name, um, please come join me at the podium. From KOAT Channel 7, we have Mary Lynn Roper. <laughs> Eric Green. <laughs> Terry Hernandez. Letty Carter. And Rena Ginya, I'm gonna say her name wrong, Ginya Guy Yodu, am I saying that even close to right? <laughs> Raina. How do you say your last name, Raina? Green. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm not good with this. I already told our people that I'm gonna butcher their names, so they're expecting it. I told them it was, um, it was Elizabeth's fault if I say them wrong. <laughs> so um, from the APS Materials Warehouse, we have Jerry Venesius. Vanessi yes, yes. Joshua Niarati and Dale Kernens. Crescent. 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 I should have had you do this. She coached and coached and I still can't get it right. So, and the APS Community Clothing Bank um, had key coat volunteers, Carolyn Garcia. And Lloyd Burt Garcia, and I think that Lloyd is not here tonight. So again, I wanna thank all of you. Um, it takes, it really takes a community to do this one um, with that many coats. And they're not just giving to APS, but they're giving all over um, the central area in, in New Mexico to help the children in need. So again, thank you so much for what you've done for our students.
running joke. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, the, next the next recognition will be introduced by Dr. Cerner Marmon, Assistant Superintendent of Equity Instruction and Support. Dr. Piercy, members of the board, Superintendent Reedy, tonight I have the honor of recognizing the team that helped with the charter school renewal process. As you recall, the AP Office of Innovation and School Choice uses a team of internal and external educational experts to review and evaluate the renewal applications from charter schools. This past year, the six member teams reviewed the applications for the 10 applicant schools. Having a team provides transparency to the process and allows a team of experts to provide a solid recommendation to you. Many of the participants were able to join us this evening. As I call your name, will you please come to the podium? Judy Bergs, APS Manager of Charter School Business. Carla Green, APS Special Projects. Rachel V. Hill, APS Principal Support. Robert Beatty, Executive Director of Robert F. Kennedy Charter School. Bernadette Fritz, Principal of Nuestros Valores Charter School. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Goswick, International Baccalaureate Coordinator at Sandia High School. Debbie Elder, APS Executive Director of Innovation and School Choice. Bur Barb Langmaid, Head of School at International School at Mesa del Sol. Todd Nos, Principal of New Mexico International School. Anne Marie Strangio, Principal at Lou Wallace Elementary School. Ludi Gomez, Assistant Principal of Christine Duncan Heritage Academy. Ellen Bellamy, Principal of William and Josephine Dorn Community Charter School. Chris Sanchez, APS Principal Support. Eric Bose, Executive Director of Albuquerque Charter Academy. Amy Chase, Principal at Mountain Mahogany Community School. Sherry Jett, APS Principal Support. Antoinette Valenzuela, Principal of Hayes Middle School. Moises Padilla, Executive Director of Siembra Leadership High School. Monica Aguilar, Nuestros Valores Charter School. Amy Malazzo, APS Senior Director of Secondary Education. Leah Gutierrez Weir, APS Service Center Administrator. Kimberly Peña Hansen, Executive Director of Gordon Burnell Charter School. Lisa Meyer, Principal of Digital Arts and Technical Academy. Casey Benavides, Principal of Cien Aguas International School. Shell Marie Harris, Assistant Principal of E Academy. Evelyn Hunemuller, CEO of Digital Arts and Technical Academy. Rebecca Florians, Assistant Principal of Career Enrichment Center Early College Academy. Jackie Baldwin, Director of Student Support, Siembra Leadership High School. Doreen Wynn, Public Academy Perfor for Performing Arts. Cheryl Williams, APS Director of Career and Technical Education. Pat Arweas, Principal of Career Enrichment Center Early College Academy. Monique Siegschlag, Principal of East Mountain High School. And Amy Roble, Principal of Albuquerque Charter Academy. Thank you all for the ways you support learning. 
Let us show our appreciation for these um, guests. Thank you so much for being here. take a little while. Um, so the, the final recognition of, um, is of several board members' birthdays. Uh, so <laughs> Elizabeth Armijo's birthday was February the 14th, Dr. David Piercy, February 19th, and Candelaria Patterson's birthday is February 24th. So I get, <laughs> I get to lead everybody in singing happy birthday. Oh boy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Alyssa members. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh, look, you even get candles. How cute. We're going to need to work on that a little bit, so we're going to have a rehearsal after the meeting. You had to blow it. Yeah, blow it. All right. Well, that concludes our recognition. Congratulations again to everyone, and happy birthday, and thank you for joining us tonight. We'll now begin with our public forum. So on public forum, uh, whether you are here with a request for the Board of Education to consider, provide information, or just see how the Board of Education operates, we want you to know that you are welcome. The Board of Education has established rules for expected civil behavior during the meeting and public forum. Upon signing in to speak tonight, you received a signature. What was, wait, what? <laughs> you received a signature form and copy of the procedural directive, which outlines those rules for expected behavior. The presiding officer will enforce these rules as appropriate throughout the meeting. Uh, tonight, there are, I think we have five, that we have five speakers. Therefore, to accommodate the greatest number of speakers, each speaker has two minutes for comments within the 30 minute for public forum. The time remaining to speak will appear on the screen in front of you. Uh, you may not yield your unused time to another speaker. You are always welcome to submit additional comments to the board in writing if you are un unable to convey your message or you are not able to speak within the 30 minute public forum time. The Board of Education encourages you to stay for the entirety of the meeting so you may listen to the board members' comments before we adjourn. Uh, only at this time may your concerns be addressed at the discretion of each board member. So the first speaker is Hall Haley, Hallie, uh, we Wheelless? That's hard to say. And then the second one, if we could just get you to line up, will be Franklin Ghana. May I begin? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Hallie Wheelis, and I am a level three teacher, a national board teacher, and I have two master's degrees in education. And I say all this just so you know that I understand what it's like to be a teacher. But I'm here today as a parent. I have a seven-year-old in APS public schools. And every day when I drop her off, I'm worried about her safety. And I know this is a concern to all of you. I know that you're installing cameras 
and you're adding things to increase safety, but in the coming weeks, there are gonna be calls, there are already calls for walkouts, teacher strikes and such. And I'm standing here asking you, because you have the ability at this point to set the tone for this and to support it. Our teachers are gonna make the change and the difference here. Our teachers are on the front line and our teachers are the ones that are gonna throw themselves in front of my daughter or anybody else the same as I would. And as we move forward, think carefully about how you're gonna do this because teachers are gonna look for you to support them to have a safe working environment. My child and all children deserve safe learning environments and they have a right to demand that. And at this point in juncture, at this moment, you can make it a teachable moment. This is their right as citizens, their right to ex freedom of assembly and freedom to actually say what they want to do. And so I'm here to ask you tonight to support your teachers if they walk out, if they strike, if the principals decide to close the school. Because without this, we're never gonna move forward. We've tried everything else and the loss of life that we had the moment before earlier for. It's gonna happen again and again and again unless we make a difference and we take the stand. So please, I'm asking you as you move forward to think carefully how this is gonna happen in Albuquerque Public Schools. Thank you. Mr. Ghana. Um, this has to do with the restructuring of Hawthorne Elementary. Um, the enrollment there, or what I've been he hearing from the community, is that the reason it was being shut down is because of race, and that it had a high population of African American students and Latino students. Luckily, I do my research, and um, somebody from the superintendent's office told me that that wasn't the reason why it was being shut down, um, which I was happy about, because my um, the, what I would have told you would be different. So I'm, I'm glad that I have a big mouth and do my research properly. Um, so that you can be a little bit more um, transparent with the community if you need to, to uh, be able to get what you need to get across um, done. Because that is not, as a community activist, what I promote. And I want my leaders to be able to have a voice to um, make a clear picture for the community so that we are um, doing the right things together. Um, and if it does have something to do with race, uh, that you guys as leaders can say no or yes or whatever you need to say. But um, I'm glad that uh, my family taught me how to do research correctly and that I do respect the superintendent's office. So thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Jerry War Warall, and after Jerry Warall will be oh, Nankan Zimbo Sinadili. Sinadile. <laughs> I'm sorry if I said that wrong. <laughs> you don't know how refreshing it is to have the easy name. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to spell that all my life. I'm Jerry Warall. I'm president of the West Side Coalition of Neighborhood Associations. In my first order of business, and I've been um, remiss in not coming and thanking the board members who have been to no less than three events at the West Side Coalition in the last couple of years. Um, the reason I want to stress and thank you for attending our meetings is that it really brings that, that platform full front for the community and the board to work together on working on our mutual problems of which there are many. Um, I'm also uh, a member of the Trust Volcanus Neighborhood Association, which is right across the street from the new Trust Volcanus uh, School Complex and the Community Stadium and now the Field of Dreams. So if there's a focal point for uh, additional bad behavior by people, um, I live there. Um, and what we have done as a community is to reach out and to to put things in place that make sense. Um, and what I want to share with the board is some of the things that we have been doing uh, to promote uh, public safety and our own safety. For the last year, and I think we will renew our goals of the Westside Coalition for this year, it will be to stress 
public safety and individual uh, safety in the home and making our neighborhood safe. But I think we need to put our arms around the school complexes and the other places as being a part of our responsibility also. So of the 25 neighborhood associations that I represent west of the river in Bernalillo County, I cover a pretty wide swath of the, of the APS school boundaries, as well as one of our members, past president, not Candy Patterson, but one of our past presidents, Dr. Joe Vias, has also created the intercoalition of neighborhood associations. And at those meetings, you can reach all of the coalitions in the city. And I think it's important for us to have this dialogue because you're going, I'm sure you've already heard, and I have to applaud what I heard today in the, and saw today in the paper of what you have already done. We also had something that I wasn't expecting, but it's Senate Bill 238, I think, that was just passed. We should be encouraging the governor to sign, which will give an additional $40 million, $10 million a year over the next four years for brick and mortar security in our schools. Now I know you're way ahead on this already, but additional money is not going to hurt if we're prepared to do that. And some of the things that we have done in terms of safety doors, in terms of door locks that cannot be broken in, and other things we'd like to share because we've done some ho homework on that, I think we can work on together. So I'm past my time, but I wanna thank you for listening to me and thank you for coming to our meetings and let's take it forward together from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm going to try to speak slowly because I'm always fast. <laughs> so I am from uh, the organization called Immigrant and Refugee Resource Village of Albuquerque and New Mexico Women's Global Pathways, which is its flagship program. So we offer education uh, for children, like tutoring every Saturdays, and we also, we also offer, oh, thank you. We also offer tutoring for um, adults. And so today I know that I don't have much time, so I'm just going to ask you to reflect when I, whatever I'm going to be saying to think about it, and then maybe, because we, we need a lot of help for the children that we serve. So we serve children from um, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, uh, and also at risk local kids. But our primary uh, work uh, is for um, refugees, asylees, and immigrants. And so we have about uh, 400 people that we work very closely with, with my husband, Lungile, who's sitting over there, and volunteers. And so I want you to imagine a child from a refugee camp who's traumatized and gets to Highland High or another school. Imagine that this child um, suffered a lot of trauma and uh, this child has been admitted to school. And this child will be placed in classes according to her age, and he will be passed on to graduate high school without even knowing how to read. When that child gets to, let's say, CNM or, or UNM, that child drops out within the first quarter because they did not get the basics of reading, and so they don't understand. So that is the plight of some of our children that we serve. I also imagine a young uh, boy who came to me two months ago. He told me, Mama Kazi, in my school, they give me A's, even though I don't deserve the A's. And he says that one day I had to complain to the counselor telling her that I don't deserve this grade. And so the counselor helped him to be able to assign him to another teacher. But he says, Mama Kazi, this teacher is not helping me with physics. So for two months, he's been asking me to find a tutor for him, actually him and his sister. So, and also imagine a, a, a mom who's a widow. She has about eight children. She's from refugee camps. And this mom doesn't even know where the school is for the child. She doesn't even know what a great report is. Even if she sees it, she, she, sees it, she cannot read it. And so I'm here, just I don't have much time. I want to be part of what you do, and I want you to embrace the children of refugees, immigrants, undocumented, and others. Thank you. Actually, I would like to ch start a charter school. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker tonight is uh, Janet Sayers. Sayers. Thank you, Janet. Sure. Hi. Um, good evening. 
Uh, uh, Mr. President, board members, uh, Madam Superintendent and staff, and first of all, uh, happy birthday to uh, <laughs> the board members. And that's especially having a Valentine's Day birthday. That's quite, quite good. Um, when I attend board meetings, and, and I am trying now to stay so I can hear all the presentations. It's really a good learning experience. It's, it's, it's like um, putting it all t together and then you know being able to, to see someone explain the material. And my little um, antenna went up as soon as I saw the CSI schools were on tonight's agenda, and that included McKinley and Del Norte. And I'm sorry, I'm Janet Sayers, and I'm president of the Del Norte High School Alumni Association. So I am hoping that that, mm -hmm. I'm interested in the whole CSI, um, what, what that's going to be achieving. Uh, and I, I do wanna, I met Mom Ghazi about 10 years ago when I volunteered with the African refugee population. And she's a woman who's just dedicated thousands of hours of time and energy to, to working with refugees. And last but not least, and I'm glad that the Channel 7 was here tonight because I have a new idea, but um, uh, Hodgen Elementary School, which is part of the Del Norte Cluster, opened in September of 1958, and there were uh, many uh, 10 and 11 year olds with shiny little faces, and I was one of those. And after realizing that Hodgen was going to have its 60th anniversary, uh, starting in September, I connected with some neighborhood people, and we're planning a year-long <coughs> observance of Hodgen being 60 years old and trying to do things that will involve teachers and students in the neighborhood and, and do some positive things for one of the many neighborhoods that's struggling with poverty and domestic abuse and and homelessness, so uh, just to give you a little update on that, and uh, again, thank you for your service and for the learning experience that takes place at these meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you all for your input, and that concludes the public forum for tonight. Okay, thank you, Board Member uh, Montoya Cordova. Uh, we'll go on to the Superintendent Report. Board member, uh, board president, Dr. Piercy, board members, community members, um, staff. Yesterday we held a press conference regarding school safety. For many years now, APS has been exploring security upgrades for our schools for many years. We say it over and over again, frankly, because it's true that safety, that the safety and security of our students, staff, and campuses are always our top priority. Horrific acts of violence such as that witnessed last week in Florida and of course um, in Aztec, New Mexico are very close to our hearts. For us, these incidents uh, make for emotional and uh, frightening times. While we can't make guarantees um, in the world that we live in, it is our responsibility to do everything possible to protect our students, our staffs, and community from danger. We take every report seriously, very seriously. Not a day goes by that APS is not actively assessing and reassessing safety in our schools. All schools have security cameras, and when our voters overwhelmingly supported our mill and bond levy election, the result was that over $5 million was uh, made available for us uh, to strengthen our safety efforts. And of course, the New Mexico legislators um, have added $40 million um, over a four-year period for state schools to spend on safety for its students. Truly, safety is in the forefront of everybody's mind. There appears to be a pattern of violent incidents in our country. Um, there have actually been too many incidents um, in malls, music festivals, at music festivals, in schools, in nightclubs, universities, marathon races, workplaces, churches during services, 
uh, everywhere that people feel safe and happy and gathered together seem to be areas that are focused. What we're doing, because we can't do this alone, we are asking our community to help us and to be alert to everything and report anything suspicious. In other words, uh, if you see it or hear it or read it, say something. They need to speak to their children, telling them that the very same thing, if they see something suspicious, it's not for them to decide if it's a prank or if it's not. Their responsibility is to tell an adult, and it is not snitching. If anything, it is a very heroic act. When families have loved ones in distress, they need to be supported, and they need to help them get the help and, and that, that they need. We can come together as a community. I've seen it, and I, it happens every single day. We need that today. We will come together to keep everybody safe. I know we can do that. So remember, if you see it, say something. This concludes my report tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. I'm not going to, I wasn't going to say that because I know it was very long. I, I just did the one because of. I thought our, maybe this is your whole stack. No. This is my whole stack, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, we'll go on to our special issues. We have a legislative update, which is a discussion by uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Escobedo, who is an inter interim government affairs liaison. Uh, yet another title for you. <laughs> um, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, Mr. Melendres is here with me tonight. We were uh, your team in Santa Fe. And so um, before we begin, I would like to uh, thank the superintendent and the uh, entire leadership team for providing um, quick and uh, great insight into a, a lot of the doing analysis of a lot of the bills and also want to thank you um, and the superintendent for actually spending time with our legislators during the session. It was extremely helpful. Um, so as I say, uh, Mr. Melendres is also here to answer any of your questions that I may not be able to answer or we can answer together. Um, as a reminder, the governor has until March 7th to sign um, any bills that were passed. Um, and after that date, any legislation that was not acted upon is pocket vetoed. I look at the budget. Um, Actually, in all my years of experience of working uh, uh, with the legislature, the I think this is one of the smoothest uh, budgets that we've seen because we did have two hundred ninety-three million dollars that the uh, the different House and Senate could work with in in making um, some improvements to the state. And one of those things was a more than ninety million dollar compensation package. And so, how does that affect us? Um, we, our teachers would uh, receive a 2.5% uh, salary increase, um, and then there would be a 2% increase <coughs> for all other uh, staff. Now, those um, percentage increases are fully funded by the legislature. Um, in addition, the minimum salaries for teachers uh, would be increased to 36,000 for level one, 44,000 for level two, and 54,000 for level three. In addition, there was a corresponding piece of legislation that actually sets those uh, minimum salaries into statute because in the past uh, six years or so that they've done salary increases, they have not adjusted the corresponding um, statute that sets those <coughs> minimum salaries. <laughs> Two other things that happened with the budget. Um, as you know, $42 million was swept statewide. I believe about $12.5 million was swept from the district last year um, to help districts. The legislature <coughs> passed $5 million that would restore those cash balances. Of course, $5 million doesn't do the $42 million, but it would be proportionally given back to the school districts in the same proportion as it was taken away. So that's approximately $1.25 million that the district would receive from that. But 
please note that the money would not come until after August when we have a new revenue estimate. So that money is not locked in into stone. Um, additionally, um, the public education department per state statute has to set a unit value at the beginning of the year. And traditionally they do it, I, I, maybe in statute or in regulation, but they do it in statute. They have to do it uh, by January 31st. And so they did that. However, there was $42 million left in the money that they, sh they sh should have or could have distributed to schools, and they only distributed 30 of the $42 million. So what the legislature did in the budget is to request that the uh, public education department set the unit value again in June um, so that school districts could then see an additional distribution of $10 million statewide. And again, that's approximately $2.5 million that we would receive in June. Um, so beyond the budget, uh, I'll go into some of the bills. Uh, we, di we were successful in receiving uh, $5.7 million in capital outlay. And those are from projects that range from um, large projects for supporting, you know, various schools and doing um, some of the things that they have requested last year. There was not capital appropriation, so we we kept those same requests um, for this year. But out of the twelve million that we requested, we received almost half of what we requested. So I think we did pretty good there. The governor hasn't taken uh, final action on. Um, any of the bills that we monitored. If you look on page eight of your packet, um, the House Bill 2 is obviously the uh, General Appropriation Act that did pass. Um, and again, no um, action has been taken on that. Um, just a reminder also, the governor does have a line item veto authority over any um, budgetary or financial uh, bill. A couple of bills that did pass re were House Bill 85, which would allow our um, employees to use any um, sick leave that they have accrued to uh, purchase, and they would have to purchase uh, uh, excess um, credits for their retirement. And that would be done through uh, the New Mexico Educational Retirement Board. House Bill 98 is a bill that I know many of you are familiar with. This is the Local Election Act, and this bill barely passed with about 20 minutes to go. They were in conference committee about an hour before the legislature adjourned. And what the bill does is in, um, it basically moves all local elections uh, which you as a board would be included in, to November. So currently your election is in February. So this would move your election in odd number of years, uh, nonpartisan elections, to November. So you would be on the ballot uh, with CNM, uh, the Water Authority, or the Asequia boards, and... Um, the mayoral election and that, that sort of thing. So um, there's a lot of controversy about the bill. There was a lot of uh, the school boards association adamantly opposed the bill. Um, this bill has been discussed for many years um, and finally got done in the final hours. We do not know how the governor is going to um, react to the bill, but we can tell you that there's a lot of concern statewide about ultimately moving these elections um, to November in the odd number of years. Um, some other, well, a couple of other bills uh, to highlight uh, for you is um, Senate Bill 119 on page nine does that uh, actual statute change for teacher salaries of 36, 44, and 54. Um, I do have to correct, I apologize, I made a mistake. Senate Bill 234 did not make it. Um, it was on the queue to be 
passed in the final moments and um, there was a about a 20 minute filibuster that that did not allow that to pass. And then House and Senate Bill 239, which is the bill that's been discussed today and um, the gentleman from uh, the West Side Coalition mentioned, this does allow the district to apply to the uh, Public School Finance Authority for capital outlay to be made available for security. Um, and with that, Mr. Melendres and I stand for questions. Any questions from the board? A board member Garcia. So, Dr. Escobedo, I, I'm I'm trying to remember, and as far as I know, we never heard anything about this bill to make APS uh, be part of November elections. And how is it that this could happen, and we didn't hear about it? That's my first question. Um, Mr. Garcia, uh, we did provide an update to the board. Um, at our last board meeting on the um, this particular bill, um, at that point, the I believe the the language in the bill had the election for nonpartisan elections in odd years to be in June, and that's the way it came out of the House of Representatives, and then was amended in the Senate to make this November, and then um, in conference committee it got uh, quickly discussed at the end uh, but the school boards association um, adamantly opposed it the, the entire way on on your behalf well it seems to me that uh, there's something wrong with this picture simply because as an elected body we should have an opportunity to weigh in as these discussions happen or before they happen and this is an end around once again undermining our authority and once again an attempt, in my opinion, to dilute uh, any opportunity that this board might have to actually represent the communities that we have been representing over the years. I'm very concerned about that. Other comment? Board member uh, Peterson? What's the date by which the governor has to either sign or veto? Um, Mr. President, Board Member Peterson, March 7th. Do we have any actual idea of what she's going to do with the budget? Is I mean, my understanding is that there were some, there was some um, compromising going on, and that it sounded like she was more likely to sign it this year than in previous years, but. I am curious what, what you're hearing. Mr. President, uh, Board Member Peterson, we um, have heard all along that throughout the budget negotiations, the executive, the House, and the Senate were all at the table the entire time. We, we don't expect um, any major changes except possibly some line item vetoes of um, language that's put in the budget. Um, but other than that, we do ex uh, expect her to sign it and for the there not to be a special session on the budget is there anything we should be saying to the governor right now that might be helpful um, <laughs> mr. president uh, board member Peterson um, my recommendation would be to not weigh in um, <laughs> but that would be my recommendation <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Dr. Peterson. Board Member Patterson. Um, Dr. Escobedo, Escobedo um, with regard to the text messaging to parents, um, I, I know that it was defeated, but I know you spoke about the funding that was attached to it. Is that still in place? Will that be in place? Yeah, Board Member, um, Mr. President, Board Member Patterson, um, there was $300,000 that finally ended up in the budget for a project or a pilot <coughs> on that. Um, we have been working and communicating with Representative Gentry who introduced that bill and actually is the minority leader in the House who put the money in there. Um, we have contacted, um, been 
working with some of our internal folks to see what it would cost us to add that text messaging option to uh, Synergy so it's not an additional burden to our teachers. We know that our teachers do a great job in communicating to parents via email, phone calls, but what could we make it so that if they're sending an email, could they also automatically send them a text message at the same time? So we're working through all of that. I know that there's a lot of concerns about how it would work. Is it a violation of FCC law and uh, you know text messaging and all of those things? And I think the, the pilot would allow us to figure some of those things out. Um, so we're looking at it. We don't know how PED would distribute that money, if it would actually come to the district. Uh, we do know that um, Representative Gentry is very interested in us exploring this as an option. So, okay, May I follow up, Dr. Pearson? Okay, Dr. Escobedo, with regard to that, I'm thinking of the of the places where you, or the place where you may want to pilot this uh, particular project, would it be limited to um, APS district, or would we be looking at rural areas around the state? Have they given any thought to that? Um, Mr. President and Board Member Patterson, um, to answer your question, both. Um, so how would it work in a large urban environment? like us, but let's be reminded, and I was listening to the budget show, you didn't think I was listening, but the budget show last <laughs> night, Mr. Elder said a comment that really resonated with me, and he, you know, we are a urban, suburban, and rural school district, mm -hmm. so we could almost pilot it for the entire state, but to your point, you know, there was a lot of discussion about this bill, what happens in yeah. certain parts of the community um, and I think Representative Salazar from the Four Corners area was telling us that his phone only works in his bathroom, but doesn't work <laughs> from any other place in his, it, where he lives in rural New Mexico. Yeah. So right. we would be willing to work with them. And again, we don't know if that money will be stripped out of the budget or how PED would do that. So we would be working through Representative Gentry on that. All right. Thank you very much for your work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Other comments? You good to get two comments? Yeah. Okay. Some people aren't taking any. I mean, I just you don't have to you don't have to comment. It's it's not a requirement. It's okay. In regard to the text mess messaging, I mean, I think it's once again legislators trying to do things without consulting the people who are doing the work and the teachers in the classroom who have those relationships with parents. I mean, one of the hard things is that for some of the most vulnerable and fragile children, parents don't have cell phones, or they have cell phones where it expires, they get a new number. You know, one of, one of the things that we've got to figure out is how to have meaningful relationships with parents in things like the community schools, and it disregards the hard work that's already being done by teachers trying to stay in touch with parents with just this mechanical one, one size fits all solution instead of trying to really analyze how do, we, how do we help support parents and teachers in that relationship. So hopefully with things like our community schools, we can be looking at how do we guarantee that parents have the information that they need, but how do we do it in a way that's meaningful and not just one more bureaucratic stress on teachers. So I'm, if we do indeed get some part of that 300,000, I think we need to really look at what would be a meaningful way to, to actually use it where it makes a difference. Thank you. Other comments? I mean, I have just yes, kind of going to yeah. what, um, Barbara just said, is if we, it seems like that that is not something that a lot of us are for because it just puts another burden on teachers having to do something else unless we make it easier as you were alluding to. But if it's not something that we really want to do, why do we want to even pursue that 300, that, you know, the money anyhow if it's not something that we're all 100% behind? Uh Mr. President and um, 
Board Member Mueller Aragon, um, you're correct. I'm not saying that the district is going after this. I'm just letting you know some of the conversations that have been made to us that, you know, this bill didn't go forward. I had money in the budget. Um, this is from Representative Gentry. So this is a possibility if you all are interested in exploring this. And so no decision has been made at the district level to seek the money out or not. So I just wanted to make sure I was clear. Okay. Okay, thank you, Joseph. I appreciate greatly uh, what you guys have done at the legislature. Um, I think relative to the texting thing, it also brings up a liability issue because if it happens to be a requirement that you do this, the question is, well, what if my kid didn't actually get the text and therefore he didn't do well on the test and now uh, I'm going to hold you guys responsible because you're supposed to give me texts. And uh, that could be all kinds of reasons why you didn't get a text. So there are all kinds of issues with regard to this kind of a thing. And I think, again, some basic principles are I think it is messing with our local control. I think uh, the teachers are doing a great job probably with in terms of getting the message out and what kind of tests are we talking about? You know, are we talking about just the summative tests in terms of park? Well, if everybody doesn't know about park by the time they come to school, then they're, they're not paying attention. And, uh, you know, so there are a lot of questions with that. So, uh, but I appreciate greatly, and uh, we do need to kind of, I think, uh, pay attention to the election thing. I think we did, uh, again, we, uh, that's one of those things I don't understand exactly how it ever got through, because in fact, as I understand it, even the sponsor didn't like what went through. So, <laughs> that's pretty hard when you got sponsors of the bill that didn't like what went through. So, so uh, uh, hopefully we'll, will the governor will ignore it but uh, I like your suggestion probably it's not not great for us to be saying too much maybe others will say enough that'll make a difference because I'm pretty sure the New Mexico School Board Association will in fact be saying something to the governor and that's we're represented by them so I think that'll take care of it so thank you very much appreciate it thank you uh, we'll go on to uh, item uh, B, which is the update of the fiscal year 2019 budget, and that's a discussion. Tammy. Good evening, President Piercy, members of the board. Um, what we are here, what, what we're going to do this evening is give you a presentation, which is an update on the budget process. As Joseph just indicated, uh, we are awaiting the governor's signature on the legislation that just passed uh, through both house, both chambers of the legislature. Uh, once the governor has actually signed off on the legislation that she is going to sign off on, uh, then the language of all of that legislation will actually go to the public education department. They will prepare their interpretations and their instructions on how to exactly implement the language, the new language in the law. Um, at that point, PED will calculate uh, the SEG on a statewide basis, that is the state equalization guarantee. And we normally have our final SEG number the first week in April. So we're still you know, fairly early in the process, but uh, the budget office is working really hard behind the scenes, um, preparing uh, uh, documentation, analyzing different pieces of legislation, costing out different, uh, different scenarios, and that sort of thing. And so uh, she basically has prepared an updated presentation to kind of let you know where we are in the process. Um, any of the, um, the salary increases and things that you'll see, she's, she's, kind of, she's placed them there, but the fact is, is there's, there's still some unknowns, and so, we still have a lot of work to do, and PED will have a lot of work to do in kind of giving us those interpretations. So let me let her go through her presentation, and then we'll stand for some questions. Teresa. Um, thank you, Tammy. Um, Mr. President, members of the board, what I have for you today is basically just an update from the last presentation that you had. You're going to see a lot of similar or familiar slides as we go through this. Um, the audience may have been able to get some copies as well. I think there are some around um, if you're interested. The slides will be hard to see, so thus the handouts. <laughs> so on page two, um, 
this is our, um, oh, thank you. Sorry. So this is basically our timeline for the budget. You um, saw this on the last presentation. It just kind of gives you a guideline of when we need to have things done. So I'm not going to go over it step by step. So this um, slide should be a little bit familiar to you. This is our breakdown according to the PED on how they um, categorize the funds that we receive. In this whole presentation, it will be only over the SCG funding that we get. It is not all funding through the district, but just the operational funding. So this is how PED describes uh, the different areas of, <coughs> of money that we receive. So for example, 1,000 is direct instruction, which is the large lilac L area of the graph. <coughs> what we're trying to do is show kind of another way to look at things, and that is what is the student impact from the funds that we get? So what I did was I took the way PED describes everything in their functions, and I broke them down in four areas. The first area is direct student impact, which is what I call learning interaction. These are the things that um, the student has direct impact with, the teacher, anything that the student actually is involved with. Other direct student impact, which includes things like the curriculum, health and safety of the school, maintenance of the school buildings. Um, they can't have learning if they don't have a school to have it in. Um, then we broke it down into indirect impact on the students. The, uh, and that actually breaks into two sections. One of the most popular things that uh, you hear throughout the news is that uh, everybody's top heavy, that all the money is in central administration. That is PED's 2300 function. In my analysis, it is the indirect student impact central administration. It's the same number. We didn't skew that in any way. Then the fourth area is indirect student impact central services. That's the rest of us that are behind the scenes that are critical to the students learning. However, we're not in touch with them one-on-one. -on -one. It's paying our staff. It's doing the budget. It's, um, you know, procurement. Thank you. All, HR. It's, it's, you know, all of us that are behind the scenes. So, in doing that, this is what the graph would look like. 92% of our funds are actually impacting students directly. And then 7.5% in an indirect method. To see how I came up with those numbers for, um, for those of you who, who like to do that, um, let me, before I say that, this next page, page six, this is taking everything PED has described in their functions and listed it the way that we're looking at it in the direct versus indirect impact to the students. So these are verbatim out of their language, but just rearranged a little bit differently. So what I was gonna say is, for those of you who'd like to know how I came up with that, pages seven through nine actually show the percentages. So I don't really wanna go through those, but anybody who has questions about it is more than welcome to contact me. <clears throat> so skipping to page 10, this is our state equalization guarantee, um, a look at it over the past several years, since 2008. As you can see, it's been a little um, hard to follow, I guess. Um, this year, we are looking at 622 million in the SCG funding based on the new student uh, unit value that came out on January 31st. So it's a slight increase. So the next slide, um, we were asked to give you a look at how our fixed costs compare to our non-fixed costs. Keep in mind that this does not include staff or benefits in any way. This is everything else, though. So our fixed costs are things like um, the elections, our insurance, our legal fees, taxes, and our biggest one, of course, is utilities. Our non-fixed costs are things like advertising, assets, buses, contracts, other textbooks that we help with the uh, supplementing the um, instructional materials fund, um, our Xerox copy machine, that sort of thing. Our fixed costs are roughly 31 to 32 million a year. 
that comes out to about 5% of the total SCG budget. Um, our non-fixed assets are 25 million, and, and we've been steadily cutting those, um, and that's primarily because our budget has been being cut. So we've been really doing some due diligence to um, tighten our, our, our belt, so to speak. Um, so I wanted to give you kind of a look at our utilities over the past five years. Uh, the communications, of course, is our phone services, our electricity, uh, gas for the buildings, and water and sewer. You'll notice that the gas has gone down the last couple of years, and that's <coughs> primarily because we've had pretty warm winters. But we also want to point out the fact that our FDNC team have a program called WEC, which stands for Water Energy Conservation Committee, and they have been really working hard at helping us bring down our costs and our utilities, turning off unused um, items and that sort of thing. So we really want to give them a shout out to say thank you for helping us bring these costs down. So here's the kind of the meat of it. Um, currently, the estimated revenue that we're looking at, because of the recent increase in unit value, we are looking at about a $4 million increase if we stay flat funded. So in other words, if they were to roll over the unit value as we received it on January 31st, it would look about $4 million extra. Now that is without taking the student population decrease into consideration. When you take that student population decrease into consideration, <laughs> you're looking at about a $6 million decrease. Um, there are some other factors involved in the unit value, such as training and experience, the at-risk index, and some other items that have an impact there as well. And then I have listed, as uh, Ms. Coleman mentioned earlier, the, the raises that are on the table. So the 2.5% increase, the tier increases, and the 2% increase. And then the other thing on the table is the small school size adjustment may go away. There is language in the legislation that um, certain schools may not qualify for the low um, small school size adjustment, which could cost Albuquerque Public Schools about $1.7 million. Mm -hmm. So that's, so looking at our SCG coming in, it looks decent at $12 million, but then we need to look at the expenses going out. So of course, with fewer students, there would be a few f fewer staff to the tune of about $3 million. With the raises that are coming in, they will also go right back out. So you'll notice that those numbers are exactly the same as the ones above, only in negative. Um, as Ms. Coleman said, we do not know at this time exactly how that language will play out. Um, we're hoping that they are giving us enough to actually fund what we will have to spend, uh, but we won't know that until we get the actual uh, recommendations from them. Um, there's some other small changes like um, the benefits that switch in January. We're looking at about 750,000 for that. Um, and then um, some co fixed cost increases. The good thing there is PNM is not going to um, take us at nine and a half percent like originally we thought they were going to. So we dropped that down from 3.5 million to about a million is what we're thinking about. So that comes to a little over 14 million, leaving us still in a shortfall of about 1.4, which that's fairly manageable. So some of the considerations that we're looking at this year um, and some of the budget requests that have come in from different departments, our instructional materials uh, has been steadily declining in funds. And there's a graph on the next page that'll kind of show you about that. But we also have a lot of outdated materials. We've been given a three to seven year plan um, that will roughly cost us about $30 million to get back into sync um, with, with the adopted policy or the, the legislative adopt adoption. The first year phase of that would run us roughly $9 million. Um, district wide custodial shortage with the increase in square footage and uh, that sort of thing, we're about 120 custodial members short. So that's roughly $4 million. Athletic trainers have asked to be moved from a .4 to a 1.0 in all the high schools. That actually um, amounts to moving from a 5.2 FTE to a 13 FTE at about $500,000. Uh, 
Engineering the Future is a magnet program at Valley High School. Um, they will be looking at about six FTE to start that program for about 300,000. The assistant principals, uh, principals and assistant principals are asking for an allocation formula change. Um, it would generate approximately 23 FTE uh, and cost us about $2.1 million. Um, then we also have art or music in every elementary school. We have a three to seven year plan for that as well. Uh, that will roughly run us seven million in total with the beginning starting year of about 1.2 million. So we're looking at about 17 million in requests to come out of the budget. At the bottom, I've just noted that there is a temporary recurring cost currently for the ESSA schools, the MRI, CSI, and TSI, that we will be setting aside a million dollars to help assist those schools in getting uh, to where they need to be. So instructional materials, just to kind of show you what they've been going through. Uh, back in 2019, the district received over 8 million, uh, excuse me, 2009, my glasses are not, my bifocals don't work too good. <laughs> uh, 2009, 8 million five, we are down to 2 million three. Um, that's a significant cut and we have to try to make that up through operational. And, and we are currently two years behind in the adoption cycle. So then the rest of the presentation is, we wanted to share some interesting information that we found across the state. Um, you might be familiar with this report. I'm hoping everybody is familiar with the report that was recently done by the New Mexico um, Coalition of, of um, School Educational, Educational Leaders. For some reason, it just left me, NIMSL. Um, they did this study across the state using the information found on the PED website um, for, or PED's OVMS operation systems, anyway, for this year, for the 17-18 school year, that compared, or at least listed, I don't know that compared is the right statement, it listed all of our SCG funding or our, our, um, our funding according to their functions. Well, I took that information and made a few slides out of it just, just so we could kind of see how things look. And then I also did another slide based on some information from PED um, on a per pupil um, revenue. So on slide 17, we just picked a few schools. One of the ones that we did pick on purpose was Texaco, and that is because they have been in the news a lot as a, um, you know, one of the benchmarks of where money is. Uh, we were also giving a presentation last week, I believe it was, two weeks ago, at the um, West Side Coalition. And one of their members did ask us specifically about Texaco, so we thought we'd shed a little light on that here. Mm -hmm. um, so what this shows is using the data from NIMSL, where some of the, some of the um, funding plays out across the district. Um, there was no specific reason for these particular schools, but um, we just wanted to kind of show how things lay out for us. On slide 18, it is the same information, but in FTE form. So the first page that you just saw was dealing with the dollars itself in percentages, and this is the FTE in percentages. And they pretty much follow each other. Where the money is is where the FTE is. And then this slide is um, showing the comparison in SEG funding. I think one of the things that gets lost in translation is when we're talking about SEG funding and we're talking about the unit value, how the units are determined is different for every school district. If you have higher risk, you get certain points. If you have higher teacher experience, you get certain points. If you are a small school, you get certain points. All of those points add up to a unit, which is what they multiply by the unit value. So it's kind of hard to say one school is compared, or one district is compared to another district. Um, for example, you'll notice in the narrative, one of the um, lowest receiving schools is Hobbs at $6,800 per student and yet Mosquero is at $29,000 per student. So it's really hard to you know, say everybody's getting the same thing and that when you look at one person's um, function one 
spending versus someone else's function one spending, you know, it's different. Texaco, for example, has a little more money. They can maybe afford a little higher teacher than we can or, or another smaller district can. So that was just kind of an interesting point that I thought might be helpful. Oh, the next slide is not up here because it is too big, but your last page is the entire district, I mean the entire state. Every district is listed here. I would have loved to have do, done that on every one of these examples, but as you can see, my bifocals probably won't even work on this. They don't. <laughs> so this is every state, and this is only, I mean every district in the state, thank you. Um, but this is only for function 1000. This is only what PED considers direct instruction. So with that, um, I do stand for questions. Questions for board members? Uh, board member Armeo. Thank you, thank you very much for putting this together. Um, I think I was just a little surprised that you didn't have more requests listed out. I mean, I was just a little surprised <laughs> on the, maybe those are just the requests you have so far. Correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure more will come. Okay, yeah, I was just like, wow, this is a great year. And then um, the other, the couple other questions I had written down was, um, why do we have such a shortage on our custodial staff? Funding, funding. As we've added, we've added. I'll, def yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, Board Member Armijo, we have uh, added significant square footage over the last 10, 10 to 15 years. 10 years during um, very tight budget years, mm -hmm. and we have not been able to add the custodial staff in proportion to the square footage that we have added. Mm -hmm. Bottom line? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, I have a question. Uh, um, and, and again, just so, I mean, these requests are so very important, especially our instructional material and, and getting caught up. Um, as well as having that art and music in every every year in every school. So great request so far. And thank you for the for the presentation. Other comments? Board Member Patterson. Okay. Thank, thank you for all your work. Um, it, it, this is just one request and I know that it's been made in the last year or so. I'm, a request for the teacher mentoring program. Do we have any funding allocated for that? Um, Mr. President, Madam, um, Patterson, I am not sure that there is any actual funding earmarked for that. I know there has been lots of talk about trying to use Title II for that. We do have the mentoring program. Um, we do run that through our HR department. I don't know if Tammy wants to add. There actually is quite a bit allocated for the mentoring program, and actually Ellen probably knows this better. There's, there's, I think, a couple of million dollars every year that goes into that to pay for the mentors. Yeah, so it, it is funded and it will roll forward as a funded program. It will roll forward, okay. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you, thank you. Other comments? Board Member Peterson. Let's see, so one thing that I was just trying to figure out regarding, and thank you for the report, it's, and the comparisons and all of that is very helpful when we're talking to constituents. And, but one, one detail thing, where does, the information that's on page 11 with fixed costs versus non-fixed costs, where is that in the pie chart on page eight? Which, which little pie piece is that? Uh, Mr. President, um, Ms. Peterson, the, the hard part of that is it's everywhere. Okay. So we have fixed costs you know, everywhere. Every building has utilities. We have non-fixed costs everywhere. Everybody, you know, there's maintenance everywhere. So it, there is no specific piece of the pie for that. Now, the majority of it for utilities is actually in the peach colored, the 12.7%. Are you talking about this particular pie chart? Okay, it does, either, yes. either one, I'll look at Yes, the, in that particular pie chart, the peach color is actually your maintenance and operations. Right. And so the utilities are in there. So that's a significant portion. But all of these fixed costs are spread everywhere throughout the district. Okay, they are, they are all of the supply budgets, any contract services, software, 
um, any of those types of costs that departments use. It's, it's um, even, even for, for, the, uh, for the school supplies, uh, school budgets, their non-salary budgets are part of those fixed and non-fixed costs. So it's really kind of a different look at it. It is everything in operational that is not salary and benefits. Okay. So it's spread throughout. I may still be scratching my head on that one for a bit, but okay. I may ask you more questions later regarding that. Good. Um, let's see, and another thing, looking at the utilities, I know that we've been working really hard on conservation, and when I look at electrical costs, they've stayed really consistent. Is that because of PNM rate increases? Mm -hmm. So that our conservation sure hasn't changed? Well, the conservation, I believe, has changed. Now, as our right. costs have gone up and our square footage has gone up, we've stayed relatively level mm -hmm. on that. So. Had we not had our conservation efforts in place, mm -hmm. you probably would have seen a spike in that mm -hmm. because of the additional square footage and because of the increased costs. Okay. Um, one of the one of the real problematic, and I I don't know that this is anything that can get responded to tonight, but I think it's something that we just need to be thinking about. One is that. Although I'm glad that we weren't facing cuts this legislative session, the fact that the legislature allocated the $2,500 only for classroom teachers, which means it leaves out all of our other certified staff. Is that correct? SLPs, we won't be funded directly for other certified staff, and it means that the people who get paid the least, like our cafeteria workers, our M and O folks, our EAs, are going to be getting an, a less dollar amount increase, even though they've borne the brunt most most hard with past cuts. Is that a true assessment? It probably is. Yes. Yes. Now, part of the. Uh, interpretation that I mentioned earlier, the interpretation between exactly what the legislation says, mm -hmm. what the governor signs, she, she, she has the power to veto some of the language, um, but, but, but that interpretation then will have to be um, uh, vetted really by public education department. So we'll see exactly what language, what interpretations they give us, what instructions they give us as far as those other groups of, of employees that you mentioned. Yep. The other certified. Yep. So as we look at, at this budget, I mean, first off, those are negotiated agreements right. and so those are things that are going to be bargained with with the units that represent those folks. Number one, but number two, we just we have an obligation to figure out how we're going to do right by all of our employees. The other thing is just uh, by the by, um, I mean the list of need can go on and on, and and this just doesn't even come close to actually shoring us up for the need. But a couple of things I, I think we need to be thinking about. One is instructional materials. We have some horrendously horrible out-of-date instructional materials. But I know if we give schools more voice in what they get, if we make fewer centralized decisions and turn over more power and authority in what gets purchased, I think that we could look at first off having having better materials in the hands of the people that are actually using them and you know possibly look at saving money. I just think we need to look at how we have the common core state standards. I think that we can stand by those in terms of what kinds of instructional materials people need, but I think that we need to be giving voice to to school staffs about is it worth buying all of those consumables that don't get used? What would be a better option for, for various schools? How can we make sure that the, that 
the funding that we need for ethnic studies materials and in culturally relevant materials or you know how how can we make this decision so that's not that's not specifically a budget issue but i think it has budget implications and i think there are some places where we could actually make smarter choices if we if we look at that um, looking at sharing some of the decision making and then finally just because it comes up every year figuring out and i know this is joint with county and city too but figuring out how do we fund the community school coordinators in a way that people who have worked so hard to build up the relationships within a school don't face getting pink slipped at the end of the year? It really undermines the work that gets done. And somehow we've got to figure out, and we, and we can do it jointly with partners, but I think we have a real responsibility and we need to figure out how to make that consistent and not just year to year because it's too devastating to schools and and the people that are doing that work and i think that's this will be an ongoing conversation i'm sure it absolutely will <laughs> thank you yes, thank you other comments board member miller i kind of go to what hmm. um what member peterson was saying about the instructional materials i mean I, I would like to know at the school, at each school, at every school, what's la what are they lacking in uh, instructional materials? They're the ones that that know, and I would like to see. I would like to see what that is. Um, I think that's an important piece of information that we need. And then the other thing I don't know, Miss Coleman, is. I mean, I'm just looking at how it's just kind of gone down, gone down, gone down, you know, kind of stabilized 2014 to 2016, and then just took a dramatic drop. Is it tied at all to like declining enrollment? Are they looking at, is PED looking at that somehow? And maybe that's having, I mean, I didn't think so, but could they be? And are, uh, The amount of the instructional materials uh, that we are allocated is based on enrollment, but it hasn't declined that much. We have not gone down by 50%. Right. You know, so the the difference I mean, has are, an effect, but this has just been really no, dramatic. No. Mm -hmm. This is this is one of the areas that has taken significant budget cuts over the past decade. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it shouldn't be. I mean, teachers can't teach and kids can't learn without instructional materials. I mean, that's just really important. Can you think of anything that we can do to magically stop this from happening and I, I don't know to stop this from happening yeah from well, it came out going down 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 and down, so down. I you know w it, I think it really depends on I mean, our legislature be better next year I hope so <laughs> I hope so <laughs> it, it appears that there are some slight increases so we'll we'll see what our share of that is yeah I mean it's just a matter of pride for the kids that you see their books and they're, I mean, they're outdated and falling apart and you just need to be proud of the books that you're carrying around. So. Yeah. We felt like this was a very important item to bring to everybody's attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. other, other comments? Other guys? Um, okay, I'll make one minor comment and that is on your slide 14. You should, you should say art and music. Not art or music. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. Noted. <laughs> Just my, uh, my music people Noted. down here cheering. Okay. <laughs> Slight typo. <laughs> we already have art or music. <laughs> we need and music. So, yeah. Greatly appreciate very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we did have this. Uh, this available to us at the radio show last night. So I appreciate again what Tammy and your group has done. So uh, hopefully we'll get this out more to our community. And uh, I think this is really good information for our community to have. Uh, I think it says a lot, not only just on our budget, but just how we're doing relative to this state. It's a matter of fact. And uh, so I think this is really good information. So thank you, Tammy, appreciate it greatly. Thank you. Good job on the radio show too, by the way. Yep. Yeah, the video, the bu budget video. If you haven't seen it, it's on the on the web. I watched you live. You watched it live. <laughs> so, did anybody watch budget? us? Yeah. yeah. 
on on uh, Facebook. Yeah, I sent yeah. you little messages. And it was little. It it looks like we have Disney voices or something. Yes, you do. Isn't Especially that, Mr. Elder. It's, it's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like Minnie Mouse. <laughs> uh, that could be a you. That could be a YouTube thing. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Well, they just use YouTube. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we'll go on to uh, more of our business here. Uh, this is the consideration for certification approval of most rigorous inter intervention MRI applications assurances for three elementary schools. Uh, it's several of our associate uh, 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 superintendents. And uh, one thing I would mention again, uh, and I hope we can get through these in reasonable time, and that is that there's a lot of commonality in what we're looking at here. So, for example, in the MRI schools, there's a lot of commonality in terms of programs, the kind of things you're going to do, replacement of uh, personnel, those kinds of things. So there's a common theme in these. And so we don't have to read uh, all 77 pages of every single one of these three to get the picture of exactly what's going on in these schools. Uh, actually, one of them will tell you pretty much what it is with regard to the kind of general things. And that's the same thing with the CSI, too. Uh, you know, we have kind of a master uh, plan for the CSI, individual school information is there, and then the budgets are particular to the schools because of the size of the staff and so forth and what we're doing. So I think, again, a lot of this information is, is, is pretty much common, so I hope that what we're going to hear here, uh, just as an indication, is, is a nice summary of, of that kind of thing, and so that's kind of what I'm looking forward and maybe Board members can keep that, that in mind as we look at comments. If you've got a specific one, obviously bring it up. But I think, again, a lot of it applies across all of these schools in terms of what we're trying to do. So, Antonio, you got it. Mr. President, members of the board, um, Superintendent Reedy, good evening. As you all um, remember, on December 6th, we received the state designations from the New Mexico Public Education Department categorizing schools um, into three categories. For the purposes of this agenda item, we will be discussing um, three elementary schools that were categorized as MRI, most rigorous intervention, Hawthorne, Los Padillas, and Whittier Elementary Schools. We have been working under a very tight deadline on these applications to prepare them in a comprehensive and collaborative way. Um, we have been working with our teachers and our teachers union. We've been working with the ABC Community Schools collaborative individual community meetings have been held at each one of these schools in some cases several meetings have been held individual staff meetings have been taking place at these schools as well as collaborative meetings with the three respective schools instructional councils over a period of time this evening uh, mr president members of the board we do have several members of the um, teaching staff administrators, principals uh, from these three schools, as well as um, community members um, here to um, see the next step of this process through. So I would like to ask um, all of those here tonight that have been part of this process in one way or another to please stand and be recognized, please. Thank you very much. I'd also like to stress that um, as you learned at our last policy meeting, we do have three new principals working at these three schools to advance the work of the redesign and restructure, as well as two support principals who have worked very hard on the application and getting it ready for your review. We have worked very diligently um, to send it to you on Monday. We wanted to take every minute possible to get it as close to um, just right as possible to make sure that it was a comprehensive document that reflected um, the work of the restructure and redesign. It is our intention this evening to summarize these um, applications with the one page summary that Dr. Blakey will be going over, which is on the top of your um, packet, which really captures a at a snapshot or a glance of the three applications for the purposes of a comprehensive review at which point, upon that completion, we, we look forward to standing for your questions. So what you'll see in front of you is a document that Dr. Gonzalez spoke about. Um, and this is a summary, basically, of everything that we have been discussing over the past month. And several uh, 
conversations. It's a culmination of actually um, meetings with community members, input from parents, input from staff, uh, and really looking at this as an opportunity to redesign the schools. And I have to say, in working with all three of these communities, that we really have found that the communities we've been working with are really open to trying new things. Um, they've really taken this as an opportunity to bring resources, much needed resources, to their community because there is a significant amount of money that is attached to these applications. And so um, it's been a very positive experience despite the reason that we got into this um, experience, it's been very positive in bringing the community and the parents and the faculty together to look at how they can bring resources and opportunities to their students. And so what you'll see is kind of an overview on the chart. As Dr. Piercy mentioned, the three schools are similar, yet within each school they have different theories of action and elements of the plan are different for each school. However, the overall um, gist of the schools, which I can walk you through, are outlined in the one-page document. So the kind of nuts and bolts of what this would look like different for the students and the um, staff begins with the expansion of the school day and the school year. So there are 10 days attached to the school year for all three of the schools. These 10 days would start prior to the school year, which would um, allow for extended learning for the uh, students. There's also an hour of instruction attached to the school, which we mentioned, I think, last time we briefed you on the MRI, it was talking about the Genius Hour. So the Genius Hour would be an enrichment for students, um, really working with community schools and partnerships to provide enrichment to students while teachers are collaborating. The extra hour for staff is actually taken from work that um, the district and the union did over the past two years um, in the SQT work of what it would look like to extend the teacher's professional day. And so you'll see that outlined in the application detailed with one hour per day are for different, um, different things for the staff because just extending the day an hour for staff or for students without being really intentional with what that time is leaves us all feeling like we still don't have any time. So the work of the SQT is really designed to outline specific things for the staff to work on during that hour, as well as the students during the genius hour. So we like to say it's genius hour for the staff and for the students. <laughs> um, so the framework that we used is um, really partnering with ABC Community Schools as the overall foundation for the schools. And under the community schools, you'll see the four pillars, which is integrated student supports, collaborative leadership, family engagement, and extended learning, which we went over um, in a previous meeting. Then you'll see our core beliefs that we had um, outlined for each school, which is student-centered learning, social emotional learning, distributive leadership, backwards planning, standards-based cross-curricular and formative assessment. And those are basically the beliefs that we are designing the schools with and digging into more with the staffs as we further the design. So underneath each of those beliefs, you'll see elements of the plan outlined so that it shows you where those elements in the plan align to our beliefs. So for example, um, dual language, you'll see in student-centered learning, social-emotional learning, standards-based cross-curricular as elements of the beliefs that we have for the redesign. Um, in specific to the schools, dual language is in um, Hawthorne's plan as well as Los Padillas, and early childhood is in Whittier and Los Padillas' plan. Um, you'll also see on the side the side column, the five core propositions of teaching, and this comes out of the National Board um, Foundation, the National Board's propositions for um, accomplished teaching. And so you'll see the five propositions um, of teaching, which is designed to kind of lead the professional development work that students, that teachers will be doing for students um, in the schools. 
As far as in the plan, you'll see as if you um, were able to review the documents, additional stipends for teachers includes additional stipend for national board teachers, as well as payment for national board teachers who want to submit um, their, their boards. So we would pay for their application if they commit to teaching at the school for three years. You'll also see additional compensation for teachers um, because of the extended day. That uh, is actually designed as a stipend, and so it would be the same um, compensation for all teachers despite their levels. It would be the, the stipend for teachers for extending their day. And so this hopefully gives you a breakdown of how the plans are aligned um, in culmination of also the previous uh, updates that we have given you um, regarding these plans. And again, it's a culmination of a lot of uh, work with uh, communities, teachers, parents, even <coughs> students that came to some of our um, community meetings. And so we had great input as to what the hopes and dreams are for these three school communities. So with that, we stand for any questions you have on any of the three school applications and we ask for your approval. Okay, board member comments. We're stunned, no. <laughs> yeah. I would like to say that I, I really thank you so much for all of your time and effort on this. Uh, and I know everybody will say that, but uh, I know you spent some time this weekend, uh, which was not in fact a free weekend, like it should have been. Uh, and I know you spent time on Monday. I know you spent time, you know, previously. So appreciate very much uh, what you've done. So other comments, uh, anything? Board Member Peterson. Uh, yeah, I really, again, appreciate the whole process that you've been going through of developing this. And I think the, I think the frustration for everyone is not knowing what's gonna happen and not having had any kind of assurance that, that the work that's been done is actually going to be recognized, respected, and accepted by the PED. But I think we had no choice but to really do it in good faith because it is, I mean, I think it's a model for every school in APS. I, I think it's not just a model for schools that are in trouble, but it's a model of how do we, how do we really dig in and, and make sure that staffs and schools and communities and kids are getting the support that they need and, and that have the programs that recognize that. So I, I appreciate it and I'm gonna do whatever I can to make sure that it gets accepted and recognized. And I, if there's concern that schools are closing, then clearly as a board member, I haven't been communicating to my constituent sufficiently because we have no intention of closing these schools. We, there's a historical commitment to, to our communities and you know, really recognize the work that's been done over the years and not gonna let go of that because it's valuable and we need to honor it. So thank you. Other comments, questions? Board member uh, Yolanda? Peggy's got her hand up first. Do yeah. <laughs> you want to go first? Or member Peggy. <laughs> and then I'll go after Peggy. Maybe I'll go by first names or whatever. <laughs> I, I'm getting in trouble with somebody. Um, Dr. Um, Blakey, can you explain a little bit more about the staff hiring as it pertains to staff that aren't graded as exemplary, highly effective, effective. Can you just explain how that's going to work? Because I read that you were obviously looking at that, those five core propositions when it came to hiring. So can you explain that to me a little bit, please? Sure. The um, application asks for how we will ensure that our teachers are minimally or effective or above. And so we are approaching that. Um, question as a coaching element of how principal leaders work with staff. And so we're utilizing um, the PAR process that we have in place as an excellent model for coaching teachers up. And that would be in place for all of the teachers who are minimally effective. Okay, so I know they go through that PAR program. So how long do they have then to become effective? Like how many years would, is it, 
how much, how much time are we going to give them to get there? So if we started, this is next year's the first year, and then we have the second year, and then we have the third year. So how many years are you giving those <coughs> teachers to be able to become effective? President Piercy, uh, Member Muller Aragon, um, if a, if a teacher is in a category of minimally effective or below, they will be entered into the coaching model in the district that we have um, to undergo peer assistance and review support. They will be um, reviewed at 45 days by the PAR panel to um, really take into consideration what our PAR support teacher uh, as well as the principal are seeing in terms of growth of that teacher. And then it is again reviewed at the 90 day to make a determination in reference to um, their continued service within the district. There are instances where that is extended, um, although rare. Um, there are instances where, for example, if there's um, progress, we want to continue to see that through. Um, but to your point, when are they um, categorized or labeled effective, that would be on their yearly summative evaluation, which takes place or is um, designated or given on an annual basis. Okay, so if they continue as ineffective at that evaluation, and what's gonna happen then to those teachers at that school? If they're still in the PAR program, they get evaluated, they're still ineffective. If, if growth is not seen, just like any other teacher in the PARC program, a determination would be made and a recommendation would be made to the Human Resources Department reference their continued service within the district okay. as a PAR decision jointly between the district. Okay, because I understand with the PAR program, they have a chance to still continue the program even if they're, if they're ineffective. So I just want to make sure the kids are getting, getting the best and if there's not growth and not improvement, I want to make sure that the kids have the best teachers possible. So that's, that's what I care about. Um, and then the other thing, are there new, t how many new teachers are there going to be at the MRI schools? Do you know? We do not know how many teachers are, will be at the MRI um, schools. At this point, we're our approach like with Like new, it, brand new, out of, just out of school, just starting their career. I don't foresee there will be uh, very many brand new teachers uh, to, because uh, the lift of these schools is pretty significant. And so the need to really staff with experienced teachers um, who can come with the skills to really hit the ground running with these students. Uh, as you know, the first year of teaching is very difficult, and so putting that on top of a new teacher would be, um, in a sense, setting them up for failure. Okay, because I saw that there was a process, so like in, they'll be assigned a mentor if they're a brand new teacher in their third year, mm -hmm. and then they're, do you want them to become nationally board certified? Because that's how I kind of read into it. If they are a new teacher, they'll have the mentor and then go through the process. Is that something that's just going to be required of new teachers? It is not required, and it is. Um, there are new teachers. There could be new teachers to the school that aren't necessarily new teachers right. um, to the profession, as well as teachers that are in the school that are not necessarily national board, but do want to get their boards. And so that will be fully supported by the school as um, part of their professional growth. And that's why the stipend to pay for their application is in the application. Okay. And do you know how many nationally board certified teachers you have or teachers that, that have gone through the TPE program at the schools right now, I each of them? do upstairs in my office, but not off the top of my head. I don't know how many, but we can get that to you, um, how many we have in the district. Okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the teachers at the, you know, three MRI schools. How many are nationally board certified? How many have gone through the TPE program? How many have been on the PAR program and improved? I mean, those are just important numbers for me to have. We can get those for you. In addition, um, part of this process, which we've really been working with the staffs on, is once we get word from PED that the plan has been approved, um, we will be meeting with the staff and the principals for those teachers who would like to be reassigned for next school year. Um, there could be a significant number of teachers that do choose to be 
reassigned for next year just based on the load that this will have, their personal lives, you have to kind of balance everything in um, what this work will entail. And teachers that are minimally effective do know that they would be part of the PAR process. And so um, there's a culmination of a lot of factors that as soon as we get word from the PED that the plan is accepted, we'll move forward with offering the teachers who are currently in these schools a priority hire to teach at a different school if they would like to. Okay. And then I was also looking at leadership hires and this was just a quote that was in there, that there wasn't a competitive high caliber pool of leadership applicants. So I was like, okay, so is that, I mean, that was written, I wrote it down verbatim. So I'm just interested then what, what so happened just, there? I just mean, as there is a, shortage of teachers, there's also a shortage of administrators. So I think, for example, in one of the schools, we had 24 applicants. I think one had experience being a principal in the past. A lot of people were applying to get their foot in the door. Um, and so really looking at the ability to turn around a school and that level of uh, leadership that we are looking for and experience, um, we actually had a hard time and principals that were signed up to say, yes, I want to take on this, um, it's difficult to find. Okay. Uh, I mean, and just, I know nobody will agree with me, but we just kind of, school districts, a lot of times what we do is we kind of cut ourselves off from leaders in the private sector that obviously transform organizations that would be able to do something like that, but we are a very closed system. I think if we'd open ourselves up we would be able to find some very high caliber leaders. Um, so these principals now, will they be, obviously they're gonna be going to the Institute, the Harvard Institute, I can't remember the exact name of it. Is that something that they're all going to do or have already done? They will be going to it. They will be going. And then what about um, PPE? Are they also part of that or have the three of them been part of that already? For PPE, they have to apply to PPE, and so the principals would have to apply, and then PPE still would have to, the state would have to select them to be part of PPE. Okay, the more the better. Um, and then I, this kind of got me. So they're doing performance pay for all, so it's collective incentives, which collective, those are things we know Stalin and Castro tried all of this stuff and it just disincentivizes everyone, including people who slack off. So, and to say there are none, there are. So I'm kind of going, that worries me because someone else can pick up the slack for someone who's not doing it, yet they're going to be getting performance pay for somebody else's work. So I'm very upset about that one. <laughs> um, so what is the pay it was $1,000, but they have to, this is what also was a 10% increase averaged among all students on all assessment measures. So all is pretty encompassing, like all assessment measures, what assessment measures when you're saying all, and there's a 10% increase on all averaged amongst all students. It's for um, their short cycle assessment and their park. So short cycle and, okay, when it was all, it was like, okay. Um, and then I was kind of confused on the, there was interventions for school enrichment. So for those children who are performing above, so they will get intervention help, but it will be enrichment. So I know it said how that will happen. And mostly what I saw in that was when it would happen, that would happen during the intervention block. So, like, how is that gonna happen? What are those kids gonna be doing? I understand when it's gonna happen, but I just don't get how and what's gonna happen for those kids. Mr. President, Member Mularada Gon, there are a couple of examples that I can give to help answer that question. Mm -hmm. The first one is in the grant, we budgeted and requested a um, allocation for a transformation coach to really work with teachers on the interventions that you're speaking of. The other one is, if you'll notice, there is an allocation for a blended learning contract 
to assist with um, professional development and assistance to teachers to really integrate technology into the curriculum at the three schools to really, again, get at the interventions and the diverse learning needs of our students. So those would be two examples that we would really execute the diverse interventions that our students need in the classroom based on a case-by-case, student-by-student basis. Okay, because I thought, I know I remember, I think it was at Whittier, they talked about interest learning cohorts. Can you tell me what that, are those based on student asks, like kids want something, is that what that was based on? Because it was Whittier, they talked about interest learning cohorts. Sorry, I'm looking at one of the coaches for the school to see if she could further explain that. We can check with the school and get back to you on that. Okay. Um, and I, I, I don't remember if it was during, I, I don't know if it was during Genius Hour or what. They were talking about there would be two activities. So one activity would be on Monday and Wednesday. The other activity would be on Tuesday and Thursday. So then what's happening on that extra hour on Fridays? Mr. President, um, Member Mularada, go on. The Genius Hour, um, if accepted, the, the grant will be accepted. A lot of, the way I've been kind of explaining it to the school is this is the skeleton and then once we're approved, we need to really get the meat on the bones, if you will. And once approved, we will be working closely with our community schools um, partners to really design the exact services, the exact um, programs that our students will be able to take advantage of within the context of the Genius Hour. So every hour, Monday through Friday, would be populated with activities and enhancement enrichment opportunities for our students on a unique, continuous basis with indi every individual school. So be assured that all five days, the additional hour will be uh, populated with um, dynamic programming. And that's coming from the community, right? That's where the community is going to get involved and help with that. Absolutely. Um, we do foresee continued community engagement, um, staff engagement, um, as once we are approved, really designing the speci putting the specificity into the plan, taking Genius Hour as an example to really be able to um, take the theory of action, for example, and really tie opportunities and programs during that Genius Hour that kind of supplement or support the theory of action that each school has in regards to their plan. So um, absolutely continued engagement will take place. That's definitely um, something that we anticipate. Okay, because I think that's very important. When you're looking at the three schools, when you said we didn't have to read it all, if you know me, I'm gonna read all the thousand, however many pages there were. And I did see it was all very, very similar. So we need to have something there that's going to just be individualized to the to a school. Because I went through and just kind of wrote things from Whittier, Los Padillas, and Hawthorne, and basically it was kind of the same things. And the only thing I think that I saw that was maybe a little different was that there was bilingual program at two of the schools. Mm -hmm. There was gonna be the three-year-old program at two of the schools. And then I think at Los Padillas was the outdoor classroom science learning lab or however um, that the, that's the only thing that I saw that was different so I'm hoping that with this genius hour you're going to be able to bring in the communities in those school neighborhoods because otherwise it looks the same and we're always talking about mm -hmm. every school's different every neighborhood's different so we need to individualize it somehow and I don't see that there's any other way except that way Mr. President, um, Member Muller Aragon, um, as part of the grant, um, we will engage to a period, what they're calling the planning period, from December, correct, March of 2018 through June of 2018. And there is an allocation that we are requesting from the PED to engage in the planning of the execution of the plan. To your point, it is absolutely well taken that um, really the specificity you take dual language, take project-based learning, take any one of the components within the skeleton in the one page um, at a glance, there has to be um, the specific components for each individual school added to it. Um, so that is indeed what the planning period is 
intended for. We have included teacher stipend money. We've included um, substitute money. We've included money for professional development, all to deploy a rigorous opportunity of planning and execution of a launch in August of 2018 for um, a very specific plan for each school to be um, launched. And the thing that I saw from reading all of these and all the CSI schools is that when you're looking at students with disabilities or students that are English language learners, that those are the kids that have been left behind for generations. They're the ones that are never passing the park exam, hardly ever, I think. Um, Whittier maybe said four of 18 times there was an ELL student that passed but when it comes to students with disabilities, that never happens. So this is just, we're failing those children and we have for generations that I am hoping that this is going to help those kids because this is just a result of APS's failure for those children that have already passed through our, day, through our doors and there's nothing we can do to remedy it for them. So all we can look for is is forward because there's nothing that we can do to help those kids that have already gone through. And we know who those kids are, and it is disproportionately children of color. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. Thank you, Board Member Miller. Good. Other comments? Uh, yes. Yes, Board Member Yolanda. Yolanda, okay. <laughs> um, I know it's Montoya Cordova. I know. I know it's that. I like, I like Board Member Yolanda. That's fine. Um, I, I just want to say thank you for the work that was done because I know we've been involved in discussions and I've had you know lots of questions and I've spent some time looking at things uh, you know trying to catch myself up I think uh, in terms of what's happening um, I like um, board member Mueller Otago and I am also interested in just like the you know that test of, or how well that par process really results in us really moving teachers through that process because um, I could see that that is one of our major interventions for these schools is really moving to, towards that and assuring that these schools have, you know, that the students have access to highly effective teachers and that we're moving teachers through that process. I like the fact that the plan focuses on a lot of professional development um, because just as I was looking through all of these myriad of plans across <laughs> not just these but the CSIs it's it's that piece there that just kind of struck out to me that you know the professional development is really needed so that we can bring the teaching pieces and the teaching aspects up so that our students have just access to like quality teaching so I'm, I'm interested in in looking at that as well the other part about um, utilizing the PAR process because it's something we know has been effective is in the um, bios that you'll see for the three principals that were selected. Mm -hmm. So um, these are three very experienced principals mm -hmm. and really making sure that they are able to support the quality of the teacher in the classroom because we all wanna make sure that our children, every child has a, a good teacher, right, that will change the trajectory of their lives. And I think that um, one of the reasons that we looked for these particular principals and one of the reasons that um, we selected them was because of their ability to really work collectively with staff, to coach staff, and to really recognize what um, good teaching is in the classroom. Thank you, and I, I will say that too. I, I, I applaud the the decision on the leadership that was selected for uh, mm -hmm. for the schools because I think that's demonstrated just in their overall enthusiasm for the work and. Um, just their experience. Their bios were really impressive, as well as the, um, I can't remember what their titles were, uh, Jean Saavedra and... Principal Support Specialist. Thank you. Uh, the, the support specialist behind that, because it sounds like there's definitely a lot of uh, expertise. And I agree with Board Member Peterson. It's like, it's sort of the model that we should have for all of our schools that are in trouble, should be able to have access to this kind of rigor so that they can, um, they can get themselves out. Um, I actually liked the collective incentive uh, on my end. I, I thought that was great because I think it promotes teamwork. Um, this whole notion that um, everybody that's going to be in that school environment is going to own the problem. It's not just uh, it's not just the principal. It's not just one person, but they they're owning it together and they're owning their success. So um, I actually 
Um, I thought that was a great idea. Um, and then the only thing that um, kind of struck me is I'm looking through the, the actions or the theories that we're putting in place. When, and I'm sure it's going to come out through the community schools piece, but I think where it doesn't come out loud enough in all of this, and I'm going to always advocate for this being the social worker in the room and community piece, um, is really that student and parent engagement. I think it, it just doesn't come out loud enough um, that um, I really hope that we're moving towards that direction too where families and students are also included in the decision making and in the process of <laughs> setting goals uh, for what the schools, but that they're also included in evaluating um, how the school is making that kind of progress and giving feedback on that as well. I think they need to be part of that. And I just, I just didn't see a lot of it. I'm hoping that it comes out through the community schools piece and I look forward to the planning process to make sure that we actually lift that out a little bit louder. President um, Piercy, Member Montoya Cordova, to your point, I can tell you that um, allocations were um, requested to be um, released during the planning period for positions like bilingual resource teacher, community school coordinator, to really be part of the planning during the spring in anticipation of the execution of the plan. So the benchmarks that you're speaking of that we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to over time in terms of those data pieces and um, what is important to the individual schools, um, really laying down those um, benchmarks and those pillars, if you will, to monitor progress over time can really be identified and built on a strong foundation for deployment in August. So we hope that, that those um, allocations or line items will be approved as part of the grant. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, other board members? Board Member Patterson? Just one quick question, and I, it, it follows up with uh, uh, Board Member Yolanda's uh, concern. Uh, you know, I, I noticed that you have a number of meetings per month, and this, is, this includes all, not only the MRIs, but the CSI schools as well. Can you talk a little bit about those meetings and who is included? I would hope that it would include parents and teachers and community members at every level. Could you talk a little bit about that? So there have, um, President Piercy, Member um, Patterson, there's been a series of meetings with um, parents, um, community meetings. Um, we have had three or four joint instructional council meetings, um, which we have really worked in collaboration with the three schools in the same room at their request, quite frankly, to be able to um, learn, grow, and plan together. One of the things that was very important to them is that they would have the support of each other to go through this process. Um, we had in um, part of the structure for the instructional councils to have parental in, um, participation on the IC. Therefore, there have been parent representatives at the um, joint meetings that we've had. Um, we do, as I've mentioned, anticipate several more um, engagement opportunities for parents, students, staff, and um, community as we go down the um, planning period. So we've had several, we look forward to having even more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for the enormous amount of work. Unbelievable, thank you. To those who are here, the principals that are here from those schools, we appreciate you taking on this challenge. Thank you. Board member. Uh, so I have no additional questions or comments that, um, that have already been asked, but I just wanna recognize you as well. and. And thank you for the presentations you have been giving us leading up to tonight, mm -hmm. and and thank you for for picking such great leadership too for the schools. So thank you. Great, right. Board Member Garcia. Well, thank you, and I very much appreciate your efforts. Um, it indicates to me that there's just a tremendous, uh, dedicated leadership that we have. Thank you, Superintendent Reedy, for assembling this team. Um, on behalf and with these schools and the communities, including the teachers who were there as this process uh, occurred to them. Um, these schools don't live in a, an isolated uh, situation. They live in neighborhoods. Um, and their parents who've been there for years, uh, you know, generation after generation, we mentioned Los Padillas being started a number of years ago. Um, I don't know Hawthorne. Um, I don't know the other school 
very well. But I have a problem with the logic that was utilized to make these schools into F schools in the first place. I still have a problem with that. And I cannot pretend that I don't. It's faulty logic, in my opinion. It uses fallacious reasoning and formulas that have never really been proved uh, that they reflect anything other than someone's intent to manipulate a process so that um, charter school friends uh, or others can come in and uh, undermine the profession of teaching. You know, in my opinion, uh, I just have a big problem with that. And I'm sorry that this is not part of the dialogue. It's never been acknowledged. It's never been put forward. We don't have an opportunity to work this out. I call for a dialogue at the last meeting. I was on the phone. and. I really think it would be good. I just wish that PED and others uh, who are determined to shove this down our throats and have, uh, that they would actually stop and think about what they're really doing. Uh, it's working from a manufactured crisis. Um, and yes, our schools need help. There's no question. We've been underfunded for years since I've been on this board. Um, it's a stroke of genius, in my opinion, that you decided to use the community schools model as a way to begin to address the underlying factors and issues that need to be addressed in all of our schools. And I hope and pray that that will be successful or that we can learn some things from that. I hope that it's taken and given uh, serious consideration as these applications are, are reviewed. You know, your educa educational pedagogy appears to be one that is really attempting to, to deal with all these issues from teaching to learning to organizational culture in a school. Um, it's commendable. But I do think that there is something to be said about the collective versus the individual. I'm frankly tired of individualism. I think we need to learn to be interdependent and begin to reflect uh, values that communicate that we are interdependent, that if we don't <coughs> survive together, uh, it's not going to get any better. It's going to continue to get worse. You know, I have uh, for many years tried to understand community and work to build community throughout my career uh, to help the community understand the issues that were happening in their neighborhoods by sharing data you know, looking at the data for families to be able to say, oh, gosh, it's not just this particular family that has been cursed by God or someone, but it's something having to do with a process that we're all being subjected to. And I have to pretend uh, that I can't, uh, let, me, let me start again. I don't want to pretend that there's not something called oppression you know, that these families are experiencing and these communities have experienced. Um, you know, there are some people that believe that we should all be uh, like that math high school that cherry picks all their students, you know, and that gets put in uh, the minds of the public, or at least those that read the journal, uh, on a daily basis almost. You know, I think every student is a potential genius, but it is going to require a different approach. And I'm hoping that whatever you learn from this process will help us get to that different approach someday. We may lose this battle. We've lost it thus far. But uh, I can't think of uh, much to say, except I certainly would support uh, anything and everything that you're, you're trying to do here. But I, I have a lot of questions. And unfortunately, we don't have any guidelines to go by. You know, I won't be surprised if we don't uh, get all of our applications through uh, as we've proposed. Because I just have not been able to trust uh, the logic that's being used by the PED over and over and again that systematically uh, works to undermine us as a Board of Education. And I don't like to be pessimistic, but I have to say, realistically, it doesn't necessarily look that good. 
your work is excellent. And I hope and pray that they will see it for what it is. And I hope I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Garcia. Uh, just quickly, uh, you know, in reading through these plans, I was struck by what I call kind of a framework, framework of things that were done. Uh, new leadership at the school uh, and district support, uh, extended time, hour a day, additional pay. There were certain programs like instructional rounds, avid blended learning, project-based, community school, genius hour. And then you had the dual language, three, four-year-old, early childhood, you know, kind of across the three schools. Um, but I was also struck by the fact that each one of these areas uh, could be very specifically tailored to the individual school. So for example, what you do in instructional rounds at one may not be at all the same as you do at another school. Uh, the community school framework itself is set up so that in fact every community school may well be very unique to that community. So we're not talking about a cookie cutter thing here. We're talking about a framework that in fact we can understand because there is a framework there and that within that framework the community can work on their own individual needs and activities. So um, I was very impressed. I thought that was very good. Um, I do have one question. Uh, the submission date for this is listed as February 12th. February 12th is bang, already gone. I know, I saw that. Too. I know, because you know, Monday was my birthday, that's the yeah. 19th. <laughs> I was looking at that over and over. You know, it, it's 12. Um, and I've heard words that, well, we've got that extended, we have a date this later or something like that. So I would suggest that you put a little footnote in there that says uh, uh, we understand or we know that the, 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 the submission date actually is such and such, which is later than the 12th of February, because otherwise uh, we're dead before we get started. Uh, so maybe you can explain to me what the real date is. So the real date is, I don't know if it's anybody's birthday, but it's Monday, February 26th. That, that, that is a very important day. That's the 26th, right? Yeah, okay, right. so it's Monday, February 26th, yeah. and that deadline was extended for all of the MRI and CSI schools oh. by the Public Education Department okay. upon and, request of several districts. And, and do we have an official letter memo? Then I would suggest you put a little footnote in there and reference that yes, to make absolutely right. certain that we know that that's the case. I always love to have that. And the 26th is a very, very, very important date. It's when my wife has her knee surgery. <laughs> so I want to let you know that I will uh, have other duties that day. Um, I, I, again, I do, uh, I do have still some concerns about sustainability and scaling, always have those concerns. Um, you know, I don't want this to be a three-year project and then it all goes away or something happens. We got to figure out what we can do to make sure that what we're doing is, an, is just an embedded part of how we do work. And so figure that out as we go along, you know, make sure that this is not just a three year and then everybody goes away. And I know we've done projects like that, you know, we've had incentives and various things and it's, and you know, uh, and the scaling concern is very interesting because if you look at all the TSI, CSI, MRI schools, it's a large percentage of our schools. So to some extent, we already got a good start on scaling, uh, even though they're kind of, you know, different, a little bit different models. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, the idea is that, uh, I think as other board members have mentioned, this is not just a one-time kind of thing, but how do we really work this? And how do we work it so that, I mean, maybe this is something that's real positive out of what we're doing, you know, instead of always talking about the negative, maybe something positive to say, how do we really, categorize our schools a little bit in terms of the kind of needs that they have, the prioritizations they have, and that's really what we're doing. We're making a prioritization here, aren't we, and saying these schools really need this, the CSI schools need a little less maybe, but they need something, so forth. So we're prioritizing. So they've kind of given us a, a, a kick in the rear end to say go do this. So maybe we can make this a positive thing in terms of what we're doing. Um, I do have concerns with what improvement means and improvement measures. Uh, if it's the only the school grade and proficiency of our students in accordance with the assessment, the summit assessment, I think, I think we're losing a large p 
possibility of the real progress that may be lost. Uh, so as we have looked at our academic master plan, have we said we need to have dashboards of how our schools are doing? I'm talking about social emotional learning. I'm talking about all these other areas. Let's make sure we put out those measures about what we're really doing so that it's not just what we do on our assessment. And I think that's really important for you guys to bring back to us very specifically, particularly for the MRI schools, uh, what is it you're going to measure exactly that's going to come back to us and says, this is how we're really doing. So I know what the baseline is. You got all the baseline stuff for the park. <laughs> I was just explaining a little of that to my colleague here <laughs> about what all those one through five meant and all that kind of stuff. You, so you have that baseline, but I'll, I'll, what's, the, what's the other baseline? What's the baseline of the measures we're trying to, trying to look at that we know we're going to improve on, you know? And it deals with the family engagement, deals with the social emotional learning, deals with those kinds of things. So what are those measures? So that we can now say, this is where we are, and later on, this is where we've gone. So I think that's very important. So, so thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I am imp I'm impressed with all the work. I, Somehow, uh, hopefully, you know, I, I have, I recognize uh, Board Member Garcia's concern, uh, but I believe you guys have done a fantastic job, and we as a board need to support that, so we need to make sure it happens. We need to make sure it happens, so it's not just the Public Education Department in reality, it's us too. So uh, uh, we need to make sure that, that we are very strongly supportive of what you all are doing. So thank you very much. I appreciate it greatly. So we will go on to our, our next uh, special item, which is the consideration of the, uh, oh, we have an action, don't we? We have an action. Okay, I'll, I'll entertain a motion to approve the applications as we have them, insurances. I'll make the motion. Okay, uh, and we have a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay. Uh, all right. We'll go on to the uh, consideration certification approval of the grant application assurances for the New Mexico for, and Public Education Department for, for the CSI. And that's, again, all of you guys again. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> this part. Buenos tardes. <laughs> this part of the application concerns the um, schools that have been designated as CSI, Comprehensive Support and Improvement. And um, given Dr. Piercy's initial um, comments that we need a summary, I won't read all of them like I had intended to read them oh. to you. <laughs> Just to refresh your memory a little bit, a school is identified as CSI by being the lowest performing 5% of Title I schools, or, and this pertains to our high schools that are CSI schools, they have a four-year graduation rate less than 67% for two of the past three years. The process that our 17 schools went through um, as part of their 90-day plan is they looked at their data, some of it being school performance or student performance data, and they looked at the areas that caused them concern, dug down a little bit deeper to what might be the root causes for their learner-centered problem, and they developed theories of action in order to improve that student performance. And that would be their desired outcome. For the purposes of this grant, they identified allowable interventions in order to seek money. They have other interventions that they are working on as they develop their plans and as they work on their plans to increase student achievement. However, for this grant, the allowable interventions did have to meet certain criteria. And so that criteria is evidence-based, where the research showed their effectiveness 
by experimental study. So there had to be some research behind it in order to receive funding for their intervention. So that being said, Lori Webster has done a phenomenal job in coordinating the work of the 17 schools grants. And at this time, she's going to kind of give you an overall summary of the interventions that the schools have chosen. And um, Lori Webster, you're up. You want to read these? <laughs> I don't think anyone wants me to read these. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I am pleased to be here today. A few notes to add um, as far as uh, particulars with this grant. Uh, one is that the maximum that a school could request was $150,000 in years one, two, and three of the proposal. Year one is next school year. The maximum a school could request for this year, 2017-2018, is considered the planning year was $30,000. The PED has um, issued in the RFP that they hope to notify schools on March 19th as to whether or not they're funded and how much they're funded. Um, because of that, you'll see many schools didn't budget money in their planning year, um, and this is because they will hardly have time to spend it before the school year comes to a close in 2017, 2018. Another comment, uh, this was very much a collaborative effort between district offices and schools. I've consulted with every principal of the 17 CSI schools, as well as many members of their instructional council, assistant principals, instructional coaches, classroom teachers, in developing the plan. So I hope you saw as you read through the budgets and the portion of the grant that was specific to each school, that the interventions, although they are sometimes in common between schools, that has more to do with the best practices than um, any sort of, of plan, master plan. So we really did consult with schools very thoroughly. I'd also like to thank um, the Department of Curriculum Instruction, the Office of Accountability and Reporting, especially Thomas Piper, who heads the uh, School Accountability Assistance Department. <coughs> um, Michelle Drummond in Title I, who examined all of these interventions and provided the citations that you saw in your grant as to whether or not they were evidence-based. And of course, um, the leadership team of the district, who has been part of this process every step of the way. So a few high points of the different interventions chosen by the schools. You'll notice that they are very heavy on professional development because the intent of these grants is to develop teachers' capacities and to create long-lasting school-wide change. Some common themes in professional development include AVID, um, DataWise, the DataWise continuous improvement process that's often paired with formative assessments. Project GLAD, which particularly addresses the concern already voiced tonight about our English learners. Uh, Kagan Cooperative Learning, especially as schools seek to increase students' engagement during the day in the classroom. And student engagement as an overall theme for professional development was common across the schools. <coughs> Also a common across the school was the desire for formative assessment. In particular, schools are looking for not just diagnostics that can be given uh, three times a year, or the PARC, which is only given once a year, but uh, the iReady software provides standards mastery, so teachers can design their own uh, classroom assessments to see where students are with the particular standards they taught that week or that month. So having that level of flexibility was important to a lot of the schools. At the high school level, schools were designated as comprehensive uh, support and improvement, typically because of their graduation rate. So you'll see in the evidence-based interventions that many schools are looking at blended learning, which includes credit recovery classes during the school day, because we know that when students fall behind in earning credits, they are at high risk of dropping out of school. Other interventions that high schools have chosen to examine that problem 
in particular is a summer bridge for incoming ninth grade and some middle schools are also looking at summer programs for incoming sixth graders. So we know that students um, are very vulnerable in those transition years in sixth grade and in ninth grade. And so having more time with them in the summer before they transition to a new school is an evidence-based intervention to improve their long-term performance and ultimately raise graduation rates. I won't cover every intervention that's listed. Some are only adopted by one school, but I stand for questions and would love to answer any questions that you may have about the CSI applications. Thank you. Uh, board member comments? <laughs> board member Mullerigan. So when I was, um, I'm kind of looking at the amounts and they're pretty much stay the same. So they stay the same each year. It might change, it might change a little bit. The question I had on some of them, it was like purchasing software for iReady or iStation. So then why would the number, why would that amount stay the same the next year if they purchased it in the first year? If they're purchasing or other, a, uh, that wasn't the only example, but. Yes, I'm sorry, um, uh, Mr. President and board member Miller Aragon. When it says purchasing of software, it refers to purchasing a script, a subscription, which is an annual subscription. So it does need to be included in the budget annually. Okay. Um, and then I'm, I'm just curious because I don't see that there will be any control groups for the interventions. So can you all tell me how are you going to know when an intervention is working? Because it looks like you're going to use the same, you know, you're going to go through three years and you're going to use the same interventions. But what if an intervention just isn't working and how will you know that it isn't if you don't have a control group? How are you going, how are you going to ascertain what's causing, you know, either a drop or hopefully an increase in you know, graduation rates or test scores? Yes, um, Mr. President, Board Member Muller aragon the grant requires that we select from interventions that already have a strong research base. Correct. That being said, there is also still the opportunity for APS to do research on which interventions are successful within the context of these particular schools. It's not something that the grant requires us to outline in our proposal, so I would refer it to the Office of Accountability and Reporting and to the specific schools that will be collecting the data on those particular interventions. Okay, so the schools will be able to go, this intervention's working, this one's really not working. So they're the ones that will be able to look at that data and figure that one out. <laughs> He's really tall. Yes, um, so also embedded into this work is the 90-day plans, and so the 90-day plans allow the um, schools to visit with their core teams every 90 days to see how interventions are working and make potential adjustments as outlined in their 90-day plans as they move forward. So the hope would be that the 90-day plan allows them to move faster than waiting for three years before they notice something's not working and they continue to use it. So these schools will continue to use their 90-day plans as part of that process. So then that money, then Dr. Blakey, then can go to something else. If they're, the 90-day plan goes, ah, oh, this might not be when they look at it and it's not, this isn't working. So it's, can that money get shifted to something else then? I don't think as part of the grant, what we're writing in now, it would, we would stop using it, but it wouldn't be like then we get the amount of money to invest in something else unless we used our operational do dollars to use something that would be more beneficial to the students if we're continuing to use something that's not getting results. Okay, because we don't want to continue to use something that's not, that's not working. Um, and then, I mean, I saw in basically, I think it was al almost all of the CSI schools that there was an overrepresentation of minimally effective or ineffective teachers. Mm -hmm. And so what are we doing about, about that? Because I think it was in, there was a few schools that that wasn't the case, but in most of them it was. 
Yes, uh, Board Member Muller Aragon. It, to me, I thought it was a very interesting finding that uh, minimally effective or ineffective teachers are actually not overrepresented across all of CSI schools. There are some at which they are, and there were other schools at which highly effective teachers, for example, Highland, were overrepresented as compared to district uh, averages. So um, that's a question that I think deserves further inquiry, but I don't know that we know the answer to that. Um, because of the way evaluations are done, um, it's a bit of a chicken or an egg question. Okay, I think it's an important one to find an answer to. Um, the other question is when, after the three years, and this money is, is gone, what, what are we gonna do? If things are working, we're going, this is really working, but you had $150,000 every year and now that money's not, money's not there anymore. And some of it I know, once teachers are trained in certain things and they don't need to be you know, retrained, you'll already have the staff trained, but some of these will require a dollar amount. Correct, so um, after three years, the hope with the grant would that it would help us realign our resources, so the grants also allow us the opportunity to um, try different interventions that have been successful elsewhere to see if they are working. And then if they are working, we are able to, as a district, adjust our dollars to utilize programs or resources that we have seen have worked for the students in the particular school. Okay, and then the other thing I saw the same as in the MRI schools was um, also students of color, children with disability were outperformed, I think at every school by Caucasian students and ELL learners was, was the same, you know, was the same case. Um, so we need to just really seriously keep a real eye on that because that should not be the case because these children are all capable of learning. And I'm just kind of, of course, concerned a lot about both groups but ELL learners, what, what are we not doing to help get them where they, where they need to be? Um, and that's something that we need to really take a hard, hard look at because they should be able to get to where they need to be. Um, and do we, I don't think there's a certain year, I don't think it takes maybe a year for one child and it might take three years for another. And when I've gone and talked to people at Naleo, they will say there isn't a magic year. It's mm -hmm. not a one year or three years. There isn't a magic year, but there is a certain year for every child. And we need to figure out what that is for those kids because they are perfectly capable of learning and they're so awesome being able to do two languages to begin with. So I think that's something that, that we need to look at. And another of my concerns is on um, the assurances that we had to do. It's like, I, I don't know what that school growth is, is gonna look at. I don't know what those targets are. So it's really hard for me to sign off on an assurance when I don't even know what those are. Mm -hmm. And I, like oh, most of you here, don't believe a child can just be judged on one test score. Mm -hmm. And growth for one child and the same percentage for another child is something totally, when you look at them, completely different. Mm -hmm. So those are just concerns, concerns that I have. Um, also, that I haven't seen still is in um, our assurances when we're talking about a strategic plan. I haven't seen that strategic plan, yet it assures that there is one, but I have not seen it. So these kinds of things need to kind of all be worked out, kind of monitoring the principles. How are we really monitoring them and holding them accountable, mm -hmm. truly? I, I mean, those are just concerns I have for, for all of these, all of these schools. Mm -hmm. So, thank, thank you. you, Dr. Pearson. Thank you, other board member comments? Board member Peterson. So maybe, I've been trying to bite my tongue. I really appreciate the comments of board member Garcia. Um, you know, you look at this list of schools and especially the MRI schools and it's a list of schools and neighborhoods that are struggling and if we don't address that comprehensive picture of what's happening in children's lives, then 
everything we do gets undermined by the reality that kids live in. And, you know, all of us here want every student to have the best possible teacher every year. But how are we evaluating that? And I have to go, I just happened to have talked to someone who's involved in the Coalition for Excellence in Science and Math Education. And they did an analysis of the teacher evaluation. And it, everything in the teacher evaluation can be extrapolated into the school grades. It's based on PARC, and we, have to, we need to figure out, are the assessments that we're using actually assessing what we want to find out? And that terrifies me for the CSI schools. I mean, I just hear, we're gonna test that much more, and what is it that we're gonna be testing, and what does that have to do with teaching? But I, but I do, I feel compelled to read just one little bit. I think it's noticeable that Dr. Pete, um, Goldschmidt, who is the designer of VAM, which is PARC, and the way it's analyzed through VAM, is the underlying basis for teacher evaluation and for the school grades. He has disavowed that system as he studied it as it was put into practice over years. The mathematician himself who designed the system is saying that it it's not reliable. And so the, the coalition, we conclude that teacher evaluation systems of multiple measures that include student performance results from standardized tests are inappropriate for making any high stakes decisions regarding New Mexico's teachers' performances. We further conclude that in accordance with the paper, even using the results to counsel teachers based on the current evaluation model results could be inappropriate and possibly even detrimental in many cases. It is reasonable to extrapolate these results to the current New Mexico ABCDF school grading system too. Um, we need to be honest about what's going on in our schools. And to the extent that the MRI and CSI and is it TSI, I always forget what the labels are. To the extent that it's making us be honest and looking at what's going on in schools, mm -hmm. then I think we should celebrate. I think we should take advantage of it, be honest. But to somehow pull just random solutions or more testing, more assessment, instead of saying, what do we value? How do we assess what we value? How are we gonna put in place the things that actually will make a difference in the teaching and learning that goes on in a school? I think only sets us up for really horrible things to happen. Kids don't need to be tested more. They need to be assessed in an appropriate way with teachers who have the time to think and consider and look at their practice and then collaborate with their colleagues about what does that mean. And meanwhile, to have the, the structures in place where you pull in the community, where you start recognizing. There is research about language acquisition. Mm -hmm. Seven years, seven years. Yeah, some kids get it sooner. Some kids, that means if seven years is the average, it means that some kids take way longer than seven years. In the park assessment, it's not that they're not smart, it's not that they don't need content and enrichment, but they need an assessment that actually shows what they need and not, not park that does nothing but label them. I mean, we do know a lot about teaching and learning, so let's use I mean, I'm gonna support the, the framework because I think it's a start, but I think it's a start for saying honestly, what do we need? But let's not let it twist us around into something that's not sustainable and that's gonna undermine good work that is going on and that blinds us to what we really need to fix. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done.
Okay. <laughs> uh, Board Member Garcia, I don't know if he's going to have anything else to say. Uh, just to uh, just to underscore one thing, you know, we had a woman speak to us this evening about refugees from Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. if you haven't checked. Uh, I believe these young people are required to take the park mm -hmm. test within yes, a year are. of the time that they get here. They're required to take the writing and the, and the math. Right. And, uh, you know, there's something wrong with that picture, of folks. Mm -hmm. I mean, who are we kidding? And that's used to downgrade Highland mm -hmm. based on the fact that they have a disproportionate number of refugees. Mm -hmm. So how do we get the word out? How do we help people understand, like, there's something wrong here? We, we sat here as a board many years ago, Dr. Piercy and I, when parents of special ed kids would come and said, my kid can't hold his head up, and you expect him to take the park test. You know, is anybody listening? I heard it. Was I the only one in the room? No. And yet, we've all sort of gone along with this scheme to allow PED to enrich their friends in these corporations that sell these tests to us in the millions of dollars a year. Uh, there's, you know, we're looking for a Russian connection. We don't have to look for a Russian connection here. All we have to do is follow the money here and see where it went. And what has that got us? Not much. Not much. And we've lost good staff. I mean, in the beginning, we lost lots and lots of staff who said, I'm not putting up with this. I've taught for 35 years. When we had this grant at West Mesa High School, our kids did great. But when the grant went away, our kids did not do that good. You know, those are people who live in my district. I talked to them. I heard what they said to me. And I'm telling you, we can't continue to ignore what's really going on here. That's it. All right, let's go on to board member. Um, I kind of want to tell you a quarter right now. Okay, great, thank um, you. For heck with you, Linda. Um, <laughs> We're going to go formal now. Okay, all right. Um, I, you know, I had it was hard to 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 get through all of it, and being the new kid on the block, I was trying to do my due diligence because I, I, I you know, one, I felt a responsibility to all the schools that. Um, are represented in these applications, and it's important that you know take some time. I'm going to be real honest; I didn't get through them all. I just didn't have the time to do it. Um, I, and I think the thing that came to to light for me, or what I, you know, as as, as I was reading, I think I read like 13 of <laughs> of, of them. And um, what what just I, and I agree with what board member Garcia is saying is that it sort of just underscored for me like sort of the desperation <laughs> I mean I, part of it is like it's like we're the size of our district is both a blessing and a burden because we have you know we have a lot of resources but we also have a lot of schools that got slapped with this designation and so it puts a lot of burden on us to come up with some plans, move things forward. And I was, I, for me, from a systems perspective, I was really concerned about that because I was like, wow, just coming up with our applications like stretched our resources. What is it going to do for us in terms of actually monitoring and putting in place and implementing all of these practices and monitoring it and making sure that we're getting what we're going to do? Does, do we have the capacity? to do all of this. So those were the things that I just was struck with and um, I'm really worried about that. I also think that um, uh, like board member uh, Mueller Aragon was mentioning about just the iReady and the software, you know, it also seems like our school districts are, you know, we're sort of prey to these vendors that, that have these new things and these things that we have to purchase and we have to buy in order to do it. And so I wasn't really sold on it. I, was, I wasn't sure what the value was to it, and there was a whole lot of money. Um, but what it just seems to me is everybody's trying to fill that $150,000 cap, so I'm going to buy this, I'm going to do that, so that we can get uh, something done. So um, I think th what, what this is underscoring for me is that 
we really need to take a strong systems approach and looking at this as well because we are going to have to I, I'm concerned about the sustainability of what's going to happen but I'm also concerned about the capacity for us to really truly follow the dollars and follow the work that they're going to be doing and how are those uh, assessments coming back to us as a board too because I was reading our assurances I went back and I looked at that and we have this responsibility to also making sure that we're following that we're tracking that we're doing all this good stuff and uh, so I'm, I'm really concerned about um, where that's going to leave us as a as a district it's it's a lot of work um, I think our schools deserve you know good attention and but they deserve good work and we don't need to just sort of like have a knee-jerk reaction and say okay we're gonna apply for all this and and I, I just want to say that there were some applications that I thought were really inspired um, I for one and uh, you know I'll call out one I really was inspired with Highlands proposal I thought very bold you know new approach I want to change the school day I was like yeah. hallelujah you know somebody who's who's like really looking at something that's unique and bold and let's try that. Um, but everything else to me, it just seemed like it was just sort of this rote piece and I was concerned about like how these things got selected and, um, and I don't know, I just felt like there was just the sense of like, well, we just have to apply, we have to do this and these are the things that we're gonna pick from, here's the menu and it sort of was like a checklist and, and this is where we're gonna go. So. I'm just concerned. <laughs> um, I understand your concern and uh, one of the things that we'd like to reiterate with this particular section of the grant is that it's asking um, for dollars to support what the school is doing. So you're only seeing a snapshot of the work that they're doing within their 90 day plans. And so Highland actually, um, my alma mater but uh, so Highland actually <laughs> submitted more information as to what's in their 90-day plan than what they're as actually asking money for so it did help with a comprehensive approach where other schools really just put in what they needed for money mm -hmm. but we have their 90-day plans as like the backup to that uh, if you look at the MRI and the CSI applications both the questions and the rubric attached to the CSI are very specific in what it is saying that the schools can ask for and can't ask for. And so a lot of the work that the schools are doing are not articulated within the plans because the application is pretty strict in what they're asking for. Um, so I think at a following meeting, it would be appropriate for us to go over some school 90 day plans mm -hmm. to show you the comprehensive approach to some of this work uh, because it's not as narrow focused as it implies in the CSI applications. Mm -hmm. The iReady specifically has been um, actually asked, it, it kind of started as being asked for from teachers in schools about two years ago because schools were looking for something that would allow them to use a formative assessment and also a diagnostic that would allow them to see where students come in rather than just seeing the summative of the park saying that your students aren't proficient or your students are a one or a two, but they never got to see where they actually were. And so some of the work with iReady, because the teachers also don't have they have the ability, but not the time to design these kinds of formative assessments. And so iReady kind of came about for teachers to see where, teacher, where students entered. So if they were in seventh grade, but they came in at fifth grade, it allowed them a chance to see the growth rather than us always seeing the summative and never being able to see the growth. Um, the other part about iReady that has been very useful to the schools that were using it is the standards mastery portion which really allows teachers to pull which standards that they want to see how the students are doing and realign their instruction for students based on if students met that standard or not. And what it does is it actually allows teachers, so example, Kennedy Middle School is doing a great job using standards mastery. And what they do is they have like their sixth grade language arts all pick which standards they're going to focus on each nine weeks. 
and then they pull out, the teachers can actually literally go in and say, these are the standards I'm teaching, and then it allows them to measure how students are doing on those particular standards and adjust their teaching accordingly. So it really does provide flexibility for the teachers rather than us saying, here's a formative assessment, you all have to take it on this day, what the questions and this, we don't even tell, they get to pick, the teachers get to collaborate and pick which standards it is that they want to measure um, within standards mastery. And so um, the teachers certainly have the ability to create some of these assessments, but they don't have the time to create them. So, so there is, um, we have like some record or we have some, some places to look at where IRED is being used and there's, it's successful, so, okay. Yes, that's and good. IREDI has been used in all of the middle schools. Okay. And then they started using standards mastery as well, so we can see how teachers are utilizing it. I can say that it's one of the few assessments that the teachers in the school have actually asked to have access to um, because they wanted to use it because they found it so useful to their practice. Okay. And uh, I'll just add a note that probably if you, it's not probably, certainly if you added up all the expenditures budgeted in these grants, the number one beneficiary would be teachers and staff members because the highest costs are in providing stipends um, for teachers to engage in additional time to um, improve their practice, to get pro professional development, and to provide additional services to students. That's it. Uh, board member Patterson. Okay, uh, thank you for all your work. And you know, I was still receiving documents as of 10:30 last night. And, uh, and 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 I know it's been it's been difficult, especially uh, making accommodations or accommodating my challenges. And so it was it was very very difficult for me to get through all of this. And I I you know like to be prepared. So there's some stuff that I may be missing here. But one of the questions I wanted to ask, uh, you know, I just want to make a, a statement about this. There is clearly an overrepresentation of students of color here, and it speaks to our neighborhoods, where they live, who, who comes to teach at those schools. How do you really, how do you change that, really, in reality? We have to be realistic about that. How do you change that and make these schools make this community sustainable we're we're, we're you know we we're adding additional resources bringing resources to this community how do we realistically sustain this and keep these schools going how do we do this uh, mr president and um, board member what an excellent question um, I think that if we had all of the answers to that, that question, <laughs> we would be doing that and um, we wouldn't necessarily be here at um, 8.07 tonight. Um, but I, I, all I will say, and if, if anyone else would like to add, is that it's ongoing, very, very hard work that the district takes very seriously and all the principals that I talk to um, in the, the course of preparing these take this work very, very seriously and are, are deeply committed to that. But we need to look beyond the classroom. We need to take a look and maybe look at our partners in the community. Take a look at the community. What does the community as a whole, what do they need in terms of help? How do we bring resources to that community that can sustain that community so that we don't have this overrepresentation of students who are not getting the education they need? Thank you. So I echo many of their sentiments. Um, I have a quick question for you though. How will these plans be impacted if the small school um, size adjustment funding goes away? Will the plans be impacted at all? Because I believe some of these are small schools. Um, Board Member Armijo, thank you for that question. It may, um, if, if a small school size adjustment um, change took place, it may change the overall budgets of these schools. And then at that point, um, it would be a conversation with the public education department if the district felt that we would like to change what we might request. And that's subject to their approval um, should the grant be funded. You know, we're not um, by any means certain of getting everything that we ask um, in these proposals, but we ask in order that we may possibly get the funding we request.
Well, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, appreciate all the comments. Uh, appreciate your explanation for some of the uh, interim assessments, things like that. I think, again, I see the language general enough to where we can do the right thing, if we will. So I think that's what I'm looking forward to seeing is that doing the right thing in terms of how we assess students, letting the teachers do the job, the informative way that they need to do it. Uh, you know, so there are, like you mentioned, options for them to do the ways that they want to. That's what we need to do because that's what they're trying to do is to understand. And that was one of the complaints I've had about the summative assessment is that I don't believe teachers actually get very much good information back that tells them specifically what they need to do. And so the, for, the formative assessments are the things that are going to tell them that. Um, and just because we've said three or four assessments, interim assessments, that doesn't mean they have to be bad. I mean, they could be something very simple. They could be something that the teachers really want to do to understand how their students are doing and how they get an immediate feedback so they can change the pedagogy of how they're teaching. So I'm hopeful that, you know, that we're doing the right things and not just something that's going to uh, lead us to what we think is a better park test. And that leads me again to the measurement idea and saying, what is it we really want to see? So if we're seeing things on the formative things that make us really look good, look good, I mean, doing the right things, uh, then that's what we ought to be promoting. And whether it shows up on the park or not, we hope it does, maybe, but that may not because, uh, you know, like uh, Board Member Peterson mentioned, uh, I've talked about the EL stuff until I'm blue in the face and tired of talking about it because, you know, we already have the research that tells us about the ELs and how long it takes for them to learn uh, in terms of the language. And if you're going to test me in a language that I don't know very well, well I'm not going to do very well, you know? That's, that seems pretty logical. Uh, it's, it's true for our refugees, it's true for our, our EL students, you know, so, and when we cannot opt them out of that, you know, I mean, the, the, we have a WIDA test, we have the progress that we can make with WIDA, and, and I've said before to the PED, that's what we ought to use. Tell me, that's okay, let's use that, that's got a five-year plan. We don't make them take the park test when they're not ready to take the park test, because that's in English, you know. Hello. So, you know, it's not a matter of them not learning and not being bright. It's a matter of the fact they just don't know that language, <laughs> you know? And we would not do well in another language. So, you know, so it's hard for me to comprehend exactly why this is such a big issue. Uh, but I think again that we're, we're you know, to, to address a little bit of Board Member Muller Argun's concern, uh, the board assurances is that the, is that basically the staff's going to do the right things, and that we're going to support the staff. It's not something specific like uh, a, a specifically laid out re, real strategic plan. It's that we know that you're going to do that, and we're going to monitor that. That's what we're saying we're going to do. So that's the assurance, not that. I see something specifically in front of my face every single minute. So to me, that's my assurance in terms of that. Uh, besides that, we do kind of have a strategic plan. We are working on that. We have an academic master plan. Uh, we have the things that we're working on. Those are strategic plans that affect all of our schools, including the ones we're talking about at CS High School. So thank you very much. I will entertain a motion for approval of the plans and the assurances as stated in our I'd like action. To make a motion. Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. no. And let me explain is because of the assurances. Also, just I just see so much of what they're asking the CSI schools to just be so focused on iReady and formative assessments. And I just want to look at some, a child in, in a different way. And I just don't see, I think it was maybe Member Patterson, is we need to look in those communities and look at what those communities need and those parents need to really be able to help their child. And I just don't see all of that in there like it should be. Thank well, you, I, Dr. Again, I think, I think the 90-day plans 
And I don't want to go on for a lot of comments here. The 90-day plans are already there for all of our schools. Those 90-day plans involve the community. Those 90-day plans involve that. We have a lot of these things in terms of the community schools. What she explained was is that this particular application doesn't tell you all that information. And I would like to have that information. But that information is not part of this application. That information is part of 90-day plans. And that isn't what we're actually uh, voting on. We're voting on the applications as stated by the PED to us. So they, you know, they could put a lot of other stuff in there, but that's not part of the application. That's what they're saying to us, okay? I have to believe what they're saying to us, even though I would like to see these things too. I hope they bring back the 90-day plans to us, but that's not what we're voting on. We're voting on what the PED asked us to actually put in in terms of applications, guys. That's what we're voting on. Now, you can vote on something else, but what you would like to see, but the point is that that's what they're doing. They're providing that information to us on the basis of how the application was stated to them. We, we may not like the application, and if you don't like the application in general, that's okay. But the point is, I think they are responding to the application in the way that it was given to them. So that's the point I'm making. You, know, you can vote against it, that's okay. You know? But I, I don't have any other way to explain that. Dr. Piercy is, I like to read like you do. Yeah. And Candy likes to. I will read everything and to be getting this still at 1030 at night. Understood. Like member Montoya Cordova, if I'm going to be Peggy prepared, I'm going to read everything. So I couldn't do my due diligence because I didn't, could not read every single thing that I needed to read. So I like to read everything and getting something at 1030 at night was really difficult for me. I stayed up the last, I stayed up until one o'clock trying to get through it. I couldn't. The night before I stayed up until four o'clock in the morning trying to get through it. So I like things like I've said before, not a few hours before the next, the day that I'm going to be having to. Have I, read it all. I understand all that. I understand all that. And again, I think these people understand that. I don't think these people don't understand that. I think these people understand that. I think the point is, is that when the public education department gives us such a short short span in terms of trying to do things, then we try to respond the best way we can. Same thing as the board, we try to respond the best way we can. We try to read what we can, and we do what we can. But, but we can't blame our folks necessarily because, I mean, they spent the weekend, they spent these kinds of things doing well, this. They were out, they were out, they were out doing things. Yeah. So the point is, yeah, I agree with you completely, but I think that's the reality of what we have to deal with. So, I mean, we can not like it, but, but I don't know what you want to do about it, you know, because in fact, I think they worked as hard as they could. They worked to get this information to us. In fact, a lot more information than I probably would have liked to have done if I had been doing it myself, to tell you the truth. But, but I, can't, I can't blame anybody for that other than, you know, the possibility for, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for uh, uh, what the public education department is requiring us to do. And again, I, I don't want to blame them. I, you know, they're trying to do their job too, and maybe they were under a, 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 you know, a timing problem, you know, themselves, you know? So uh, we just got to live with it. Uh, and that doesn't mean we like it, but I, I, you know, I say we do the best job we can. And if I, if I can't read every word either, I had to look at that and say, uh, what's, what, what's the big picture here? What am I trying to look at here? And so I read one of those very well. I read some of the summaries. I read some of the different school things, and I get a good picture about what it is. And I feel like that's kind of what my job is. It's their job to look at all the details. It's not my job to look at every single detail. It's my job to look at the general picture. And that's my thought of it, see? And so I'm comfortable with that in terms of my thinking. And uh, I'm gonna, I gotta believe the staff is the one doing the real job here. Uh, Otherwise, they're in deep trouble if I'm trying to do the jail job. Uh, so that's, that's how I feel about it. Uh, but what I would like to do is, I think we did have a vote, and I want to clarify uh, who was yes and who was no, because I think we had a couple of no's. And so I want to make sure who it is that said no, and, and so if you could clarify that for the recording here. And I could have had a roll call vote, but I think we can clarify that. So I know yours is a no vote, and we have one over here. No. Yeah, and I, uh, Dr. Piercy, yeah. I, I changed my vote to a yes to abstain. I, I don't feel prepared, okay. as I indicated earlier. 
And my statement with regard to that community and what we need to do is deeper than what we're doing here today. All right. So we have two no votes. We have three yes votes. We have four yes votes. One, two, three, four yes votes. And two no votes and a sustain and an abstain. So do you have that information? Okay. Just want to make sure we got it right. Okay. Uh, and I do believe, though, that this is a, you know, this is a message. This is a message not necessarily to our staff, but this is a message to the fact that somehow the board is uncomfortable, at least many of us, and, I, and I'm more comfortable, with us having to do these things at the last minute. So our message back to the PED, if we can get a message back, is to say, guys, we need to do this in a little more organized manner so that we are not being put in a, in a state of, and as we go forward with these things, let's, let's work through the schedule here a little bit and let's get a little bit more you know, communication so that we're not being put on the, on the table here at the last minute trying to respond uh, to these kind of things. Uh, so that you can tell that that's a board message, not your message, that way we can take the heat. It's a board message, you know, is that we're uncomfortable when we get these things, okay? All right, thank you very much. Dr. Piercy, yes. just one more, may I? You may. Um, it, would it be possible to ask, I mean, this is asking a lot, a, a, ask um, New Mexico PAD for an extension on the CSI schools? I mean, as, as we look through this, it looks to me like we need additional time. Is it possible? What do you think? We already got an extension, so my guess is the answer is no. I mean, I'm just... You don't know that. Do uh, go ahead, you tell me no. <laughs> I mean, um, so we did ask for an extension and the extension that we were granted was for this Monday, February 26th. Right. And um, the PED, when we talked to them, and that was on behalf of all districts, did ask for the extension that was originally February 12th. Um, and it is because there is money for the planning year that they would like to release those plans in March. So if we were to extend the deadline for the schools, then that would extend their ability to get the money. Out to the schools, yeah. Okay, um, I will go on to, um, uh, let's see, where am I? Okay, I'm approval of the consent uh, calendar items and I know that uh, board member uh, Miller Argon had, had a question about the B11. It's not an, an I think we still have the charter schools. We have the charters not done yet. Yet. Oh, still I'm sorry. I had a me. <laughs> okay, yeah, I wondered about charter schools. Okay, consideration for certification approval of the comprehensive support improvement plans for the charter schools. Sorry, Ms. Elder and Mr. Escobedo. Uh, President Piercy and members of the board, um, thank you for letting us present this evening. Um, we do support the district stance of schools as the unit of change, and that, of course, applies to charters as well. Um, we are very conscientious of our role as um, authorizing agents on your behalf in providing support to the charters, but at the same time respecting their autonomy. Um, so as such, the process that we followed was um, once we found out which schools were designated as CSI, um, Dr. Escobedo did notify each of them. Um, we held a meeting to review the application and talk about the component parts and the possibilities that the application opened. Uh, we did hold voluntary workshops for writing applications <coughs> for schools that wanted to participate in them. Um, just to note that the 90-day plans um, as well as the 30-day and 60-day check-ins do apply to charters as well. Um, so after all of the workshops of the 10 APS charters that qualified to write a, an application for a CSI grant, eight of them went with that opportunity. And I'll give um, Dr. Escobedo the chance to give you a little bit more information about those. Thank you. So, Mr. President, members of the board, we are asking for your uh, certification and approval of the applications for the eight charter schools, ACE, Albuquerque Talent and Development Academy, Digital Arts and Technology, Gordon Bernal um, Charter School, 
Health Leadership High School, Los Puentes Charter School, Nuestras Valores, and RFK Charter School. Uh, we did provide you a briefing on each school, including why they were labeled uh, CSI in the deeper analysis that uh, we did in our office to support the schools in that designation and um, provided you a short summary of specifically what each of the schools were requesting in the grants. Um, and the last thing I would say is that, um, I'm just laughing because the superintendent got up. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the last thing I would say is that uh, the schools, um, from my review, um, and I've read all of the applications, I think uh, did a, a, a best job that they could do to um, really look at some of the root cause of what is putting them either into CSI for graduation rate or for their uh, standing in the school grade and have come up with some delicate uh, and some insightful ideas. And our work was to support them, coach them through the process, um, get them to this point for your approval, and um, to not infringe on their autonomy and um, give them an edict of what they needed to do. So. Okay, let me ask a question before everybody asks questions. Why are we approving anything? Um, <laughs> I mean, we have no authority over the charter yeah, schools. And so, I mean, it's a discussion item, and I think that's fine, but I don't know what it is we're approving because, in fact, we have no authority over this particular thing. It's good information for us. From our oversight, I say yes. From a discussion point, fine. I have no idea why it is we're approving anything nor what it is exactly we're approving. So Mr. President, um, we are asking for your approval of um, their grants and, and along with the assurances that you did for the traditional schools. Um, this is the only way that the charter schools can apply for the grants because we are labeled as their LEA uh, for this purpose. And so we are their LEA for most purposes, um, including special ed compliance that you'll note that we've talked about in, in past sessions. So in order for the charter schools to be able to apply, they do have to apply through us and we have to carry their application forward and we do have to bring it to the board for approval. Mm. It's confounding. <laughs> on the one hand, we have authority. On the other hand, we don't. Yeah, I, I have a real, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not dismissing what you're saying. I'm just saying I have a real question about why it is. I mean, I, from the, I, I just don't understand. Yeah. You know, because we have no authority over over the uh, programs they have. We have no authority over the funding and how they use that. Uh, and, and from an assurance point of view, we have no authority to assure anything in terms of what they're doing with the money. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't understand what the, the issue is here because if they're going to be autonomous and they're going to do their things, uh, applying through us is fine from the point of view of saying uh, we send it on, so to speak, but from the point of, of us doing any assurances, I don't have any idea. How, I mean, we can't even hardly assure our own stuff, you know, as you've noticed, as you've noticed. Uh, so I don't understand, Joseph. I mean, I'm trying to, you know, and I know I'm supportive of what you're trying to do. And I think it's very good that we understand what they're trying to do. And I'm really happy with the charters uh, trying to say, yes, we want to do better and, and we want to have some grant money to do this. But they, get the, they do get their money through us. I mean, that is true. Right? So to some extent, they have to go kind of through us to get the grant to them, and then the grant comes back through us to them. But that's no different than we just everything through? else. We're passed through to some extent on the money, you know, with the, except for the little bit we get on the top. So just from the point of view of saying, if, if we're approving the fact that they're going to send the grant, I, I got no problem with that. But for any kind of insurances, I have no idea what we're, what we're talking about here. I, and maybe I'm speaking for everybody here, but you know, from the point of view of saying if we're voting on the fact that we're willing to send the grants all up to PED, and if they get the money, we'll be glad to give it back down to them. 
if that's what we're saying we approve, that's okay with me. Because they do, that is how money flows, you know. But from the point of view of any kind of assurances on what they're going to do with it or anything else other than, I, I don't think we can, we can say that, uh, you know. So, Mr. President, um, members of the board, what you are assuring is that, uh, from my viewpoint, and I uh, may be wrong, Mrs. Uh, Webster, but that you're assuring that um, we will them? hold them accountable. So it will be my uh, role in this, just like I do with the 90-day plans for each of our 29 schools, to assure that they are spending the money correctly and we will be working um, diligently like we do with all other grant funds through our grant management department. Um, and so um, if you'll notice specifically, I did want to call to your attention, um, there is one school, Ace Charter School, that won't come online until July 1st, and we were specifically told by the PED that they needed to apply through us, um, even though we don't authorize them until July 1st. So, um, oh Mr. President, we're trying to do our I'm best to, to be supportive of the schools, um, and, uh, you know, it is our responsibility to hold them accountable um, and to uh, also support them. So uh, we're trying to follow the best uh, that we can in this um, interesting designation and grant opportunity. So, can we amend the assurance? Yeah, the, I guess the assurances the, are the same, Dr. Pierce. Yeah, well, I, I've seen that. I've seen that. I've seen that. And that's that what's what bothers me. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I've got no problem assuring the fact that we will provide uh, oversight just like we do in general. So we will provide oversight in any funds that they get. If they get it from the grant, that's fine. Uh, because that's our job. Uh, as as a as an oversight, you know, as a LEA, but but other than that, I I can't say that we're gonna, you know, if 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 this is if these assurances apply just like they do to us, we can't. I don't think we can say that. I think we can say that we're because we're not gonna do anything with them specifically. We're just simply gonna have oversight. If they don't do it right, then we're gonna call them on it. But we're not going to interfere with how they're doing it. In our, in our system here, we are going to interfere. <laughs> you know what I mean? We are going to interfere. You, you know, this board's going to interfere. But we're not going to, we're not going to interfere with them. They have a governance board that, that does that, that interferes. Yeah, they're on the governance board and they interferes, you know. So, so I don't know how we resolve ourselves here unless we actually write out what we think we're saying as the approval and and be very specific about that approval and say that's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the cynical part of me goes, well, I thought charter schools were supposed to magically fix everything. They were supposed to be have the magic wand. And oh, simply by that. being a charter school, they weren't going to have any C or D or F schools. They were all going to be A's and B's. And you look at this and it's basically a snapshot of the same kids that struggle in our traditional schools. So the fact is that the reality is there are groups of kids that we need to figure out what to do with and charters. And to me, this indicates that charters aren't the magic wand. To me, this indicates that we need to figure out how to apply the resources in an in, oh, in effective, efficient way in the in the big picture and serve kids. And that but that's not the that's not the that's not the question. So, here. That's not the question here. The question is, are we going to really look at this as an approval or not? And that's the question we have. So, and so, you know, I think we I think our motion is very specific to what you said, which is that because the money flows through us and because they have this designation mm -hmm. that we will allow the money to flow through us and, we'll, and they we'll can approve apply. The, we'll approve the grant uh, a, a request to mm -hmm. PED and will allow us to actually uh, provide oversight of that grant money if it's given back to the, back to the uh, charters. M Mr. President, um, so the certification and approval, and if I could read it because I 
I don't know where it actually is in your packet, is that you're certifying that the applicant, um, that the information contained in the application is, to the best of your knowledge, complete and accurate. You further certify to the best of your knowledge that any ensuing program and activity will be conducted in accordance with all applicable application guidelines and instructions, and that the requested budgeted amounts are necessary for the implementation of the project. Um, and mm -hmm. so, um, in that you're fur further certifying that no erroneous information was uh, provided. And so, um, I just would like to re remind the board, if we have concerns, um, through our contract, we can uh, put a school on corrective action mm -hmm. so that they can correct it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you do so, have the ultimate power to. Um, so we are not we are not doing this assurance. Correct. That's what you're saying. The certification and approval. Yeah. Well, that maybe so we're that's. We're only doing Appendix B. Correct. So Appendix B is really the certification and approval. So we don't need Appendix A. So well, it's not even Appendix A. We just like a little. Is a little, this is what, in fact, their governance board should sign, right. not ours. Right. And so ours is going to sign Appendix B. this Appendix B. Is right. that really right? Correct. Okay. So when I sign this, that's what the board is saying? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, that's a little different than, than this general assurance here, because all this is really saying is that they've got a grant proposal. As far as we know, it's accurate and that they're going to send this up to PED and that we're going to make sure that they implement it in accordance with that grant, which is our oversight role, basically. Okay. Well. Dr. Piercy, I have a question. What, these were like really not very long. Is there more to them than what we had? Did they have different because application? <laughs> I'm just saying some of them were just a few pages. Like, is this, was this everything that they filled out? I have no idea. Mr. President, uh, Ms. mueller Adagon, the applications are um, hundreds of pages um, together. And so yep. what I worked with the board office in doing is to provide you the briefing of what the analysis we did to get them to the CSI designation. And um, in that briefing, we do have the uh, focus of what they're requesting their funds for. <laughs> Um, we did have provided the board office the entire um, flash drive with all the applications, um, and so we can provide you the applications for you Ooh, please. to read, but we wanted um, to be delicate with the amount of information. So, yeah, I apologize if I made a no, mistake. No, I don't think that's a mistake at all. I, I think, again, it, it's not our job to necessarily know all of the things that they're applying for, only that from your perspective, we got to trust you in terms of saying that those things are accurate in what we're doing. Because this board, again, doesn't approve those applications, so to speak. We're approving the fact that it's going to go to PED and that we're going to provide oversight in terms of what it is. Uh, and I think it's our job to read all those things and say that it's accurate in some sense, because we don't even know these schools. You know, they're not our schools. So I don't think we're saying that it's accurate from that point of view. We're saying that, you know, from the point of view, of you're going to check this because you're the office that's doing that for us. Uh, and Mr. President, uh, I have reviewed every application. Uh -huh. Our grant management department is reviewing um, the financial part of it, and Mrs. Elder is doing a double check for me. Okay. I, I don't want to carry this on forever, but it, does that in general, sound okay to the so, board members? I mean, so you know. I'll move what President Piercy said. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I'll I think the, what Barbara yeah, said. So the, <laughs> so the motion on the floor is the consideration for the certification and approval right. of the CSI charter schools as yes. it pertains to the language in Appendix B. Right, right. Is, is so it, I'll is second it, that, that motion you just made. Yeah, and that's what we're really trying to say. Okay. Okay. Uh, I hesitate to say, are there any other comments? <laughs> no. I'm sorry to dominate this, but this, this bothered me a little, and I wanted to get it out, and I didn't want to necessarily have everybody wonder what we're talking about, because I'm still probably a little bit concerned. But, but I got to trust 
what our office is doing. You know, I mean, that's that's part of what we do as a board to some extent is we say, you know, we think that if you've reviewed it all, then to me, that's that's the review that we need to have, not my review personally. I think it's your review because you are the, uh, well, um, along with a liaison to the legislature. Uh, um, so, um, okay, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. no. Um, okay, how many say no? Okay, we got candy and we got our, our no down here. Okay, okay, so I think you've got whatever it is we're doing here with the certification. When I sign this thing, I, I hope it's for, for the good things. I don't know what Thank we're you. doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, th I think again, uh, you know, we're trying to be m more proactive with our charters in terms of how we're working with them and how we're helping them improve. Uh, I'm with Barbara in the sense that, you know, to some extent, what we're trying to say with charters is they should be able to do this on their own. But because we authorize them or locally authorize, they have to go through us if they want to do things. And so whether they ought to have have to do this or not is a really good question. But I think, again, we've, we've taken on the ACE, we've taken on some of the health, we've taken on those things because we believe that some of the principles that they're trying to exercise in their, in their uh, educational model are things that we think are important. So I think, again, part of what we're having to say is we need to support them, at least in terms of those kind of things. So, okay. Well, let's go on to the approval of the consent calendar items, and I know that uh, Board Member uh, Muller Aragon did have one question here on the uh, B B11, and that was the interfund transfers, and it had to do with uh, one of the areas that, that dealt with establishing a partnership, and I, th I think that was what we had talked about with, uh, with uh, Ms. Elder in the innovation, but uh, maybe you can ask the question yep. and get an explanation. Right. So on, and you, I don't know, you probably don't have this, Ms. Coleman, but it was from the Office of Innovation. So they were going to take money um, out of other textbooks, and then they were going to put it, the 60000 into, I guess, the board request to obtain consulting team to develop, develop a partnership model. So is that $60,000 then paying that team to develop the model? I'm just kind of confused because, I mean, I know we talked about a partnership model and that was with the, with the charter schools, right? Yeah, I so think- So it was kind of, I, I think- I think what we were talking about, remember when we were talking about when we had the ACE leadership in all those schools and we talked about the idea of having uh, more of a CTE uh, kind of a focus with them being a uh, part of a foundation for that for more of our schools and to have a model that wasn't the magnet school model and it wasn't just a charter school model but it was kind of a partnership model uh, where maybe they would be associated with APS more as an APS school but still have all the, a lot of the autonomy that, that a charter has. So it's not quite the same as a magnet and, and so Debbie was going to, uh, I know we had a uh, some other school districts apparently that had tried this partnership model or something and, and that uh, she was gonna look into that. Now, I don't know if that's exactly it or not, but that's all I could come up with. So, uh, and, and board member Miller Aragon uh, wasn't able to be at the finance meeting and so she just had a question about that. So I don't know if we can. Uh, because she forgot. Uh, yes, you're the one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm used to three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, uh, that is an, an amazing, we, we, this is a milestone that we need to put down for all infamy. Because it will, it will, it didn't happen, it hasn't happened ever. ever. And, and now it won't happen again. It so never this, is, this is like a blue moon. <laughs> blue moon. With a full I was so embarrassed. I had a blue oh moon. Oh my God. So, uh, you know, again, so I'm, just, just, I'm just trying to figure out that to make sure that the board understands that we are moving money from whatever the textbooks were to a consulting team to develop this model and that's $60,000. So I just wanted to make yeah. sure yeah. that that is something that we all understand that we were choosing to do. 
So, so does Miss Elder understand what the question is, or where it is we're asking the question, or because it w was out of your Office of Innovation, it was part of the finance report, and it was just a line item that said sixty thousand dollars was being transferred that to a partnership thing. I tried to explain it, and I may be totally incorrect. So you can correct that if you. Do. President Piercy, members of the board, I'm sorry, I stepped out and thought I was done. And so if I missed You're something never that done. you already talked about, I apologize. Um, but I did request the transfer of $60,000 from um, other textbooks. Um, and the reason for that is that that's actually being, the function of that money is now being picked up through the um, curriculum and instruction department through the textbook accounts. Um, and so the $60,000 is being transferred so that we can um, have support from externally in developing that partnership model. And I heard you talking about that as I came back in, that we had talked about yeah. um, the board request when we um, brought on some, some more charter schools yeah. of looking at a different model that has more autonomy than a magnet, but still a district school and starting to develop that model yeah. um, that research is, was just starting to come out on in November. So, so that is the area? Correct, ah. yes sir. Gosh dang. Good job. Good wow. job. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, but that was a good job. Good job, Dave. Okay. Awesome. So that helps a little bit? Okay. Okay, with that then, uh, let me uh, see if we got an approval for the consent calendar items. That's A and B. I'll make a motion. Okay, so, we got a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. We'll go on to board member comments. Uh, and I won't even, I won't even, down here, board member Armijo. I'd like to say good luck to our Sea Perch competition tomorrow. Yep. Thank you and have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you say after it gets to be late? It's not buenos, not buenos noches, I guess. Made buenos noches, midnight, or I don't know. Board member Patterson. <laughs> not as short as hers, but I'll try. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, I want to thank uh, the leadership for all your work, uh, outstanding, uh, phenomenal work. Um, I don't know, did, is Jerry Worrell still here? He left. Yeah, he left. Yes? Did he leave? Mm -hmm. I know he came all the way from Grants, or is it just the West Side? And I, I always, you know, he always seems to think this is way out of his way. But anyway, uh, I just want to thank him for being here. And he's very much a part of the community and is in tune with um, what goes on in our community and really would be would like to be involved uh, with our new school, K through 8. You know, it's in his backyard. And I know Dr. Gonzalez, if we could get him a little... And, you know, involved, he's retired, so is his wife, and he has grandchildren throughout the district in our schools, so he's one person you probably would want um, at the school uh, as well. And then uh, Janet, I just want to thank Janet for always um, making herself available to our schools and uh, for being the community member that she is. She's outstanding, and I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Um, Superintendent Reedy, for your leadership with regard to the um, the issue on security in our schools, and for Miss Holly, who's very concerned, I believe that you've addressed a lot of the concerns that she has. And you know, one of the things that I don't want to see, I don't want to see our schools turned into fortresses and stuff. And I think what we're doing is good. I think it takes good planning, and it may take some time, but let's do it right. And um, let me see. The closure of Hawthorne, I think we've addressed that uh, with uh, Ms. Franklin or Franklin. Um, there's There's been no conversation about closing Hawthorne, um, I believe. Pardon me? Okay. okay, we have leadership here that can probably address that as well and stuff. And uh, I, I thank you all for being here and staying so late. Uh, board member uh, Montoya Cordoba. Um, I just want to say thank you too to all the staff. Um, <coughs> recognize all the hard work that went into, you know, all of this pile of paper, <laughs> and the trees that we killed. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the efforts and the work that you put in. I, I know that. Um, Everyone's got great intentions, and we're all working really hard to ensure that 
you know, we just have the best school district, and I think we do. I mean, I think we already have a great school district. There's a lot of things and places that we can improve and we will continue to improve. And I will just say I was extremely happy to spend last Friday in a little cafecito with Kit Carson Elementary and the parents where it's really, you know, where the rubber meets the road and meeting parents. Um, and I was struck by the comment by one parent who said, you know, are our schools really not the best schools? And that broke my heart uh, because she felt like perhaps maybe she had a student in a school that wasn't doing so well. And yet Kit Carson is doing well. And so, so I mean, we have to keep working because it's that, it's that like hurt that I have a hard time with because I don't, I don't think any parent should feel like um, they're not sending their kids to a great school. So, but the, the principal there and the leadership at Kit Carson is definitely a reflection, I think, of the leadership of the school. And um, I was really, I left with really good feelings about that. So thank you. Thanks. Board Member Garcia. Well, again, I want to thank and compliment the staff, uh, the associates in particular, for your work on the MRI and CSI schools. Um, I especially appreciated the presentation on the budget, uh, Ms. Coleman and Ms. Scott. Um, just incredible that you make something so complex seem so understandable. Yeah. So thank you. Well done. And uh, to the leadership, thank you for your leadership. I thought that uh, the work uh, that you're doing with your department, Ms. Muir, Dr. Muir, is uh, it's excellent. And, um, you know, you, we have a good team, and I, I'm very proud to be part of this board. I think it's difficult. Uh, for me personally lately, uh, but I'm trying to do what I can to try to stay present and uh, hopefully stay more positive as we move forward. Thank you. Board Member Peterson. Yeah, an awful lot has, of work has been done and mm -hmm. I thank you for that. The timing is to a great extent out of our control and, and so I think people have done the best they can. and. Again, a framework is just a start, and I think that the way it, it, what's really critical is how things evolve in the next period of time. So I understand why people would vote no um, on these things. I think there's a lot of question marks, but I think that we've got to vote yes just so we can move forward and, and keep working at it. Uh, and on the one hand, wish that the environment was different than it is, but it is what it is, and meanwhile, we just keep moving forward. It's what we've always done as educators, is no matter what gets thrown on top of us, you claw through it and, and do what is right for for kids, and so I thank you for that. And then Miller again. Um, just want to thank Franklin for he's always here and always sticking up for the schools and always has something something good to say and I, I appreciate he always stays here through the whole thing and listens to what we have to say and I'm I'm glad that we have come to the conclusion that the restructuring is not at all about race which is a good thing um, and of course to Janet I mean yay we're gonna be celebrating those 60 years at that Hodgin has been open, so that's that's a good thing. And tomorrow, I'll be at my alma mater at West Mesa for the Sea Perch competition, so it'll be nice to go back there. Um, and to, how do you say your name, Manzaki? How do you say her name? Mama. Ma. Mama Kazi? Kazi? Just call, uh, just call her Mama. Mama Kazi. Okay. Um, just what, what she said is that children need to be able to read that helps to make him become a successful person. And like the child had told her that they should get the grades they deserve, not the grades that are just given to them. We should all get what we deserve and not just have things given to us. And if a young child can, can see that, I think that we should all be able to, to see that as well. And um, today, one of my um, greatest role models and somebody that I looked up to for many decades um, passed away. And I was listening to some of the things that he had to
to say. And one of the things was we're living in a world where we're always trying to, um, people try to separate us by race. And he did say it's not about black, it's not about white, because Christ belongs to all people. And as he always ended, remember God loves you. Thank you. That is from one of our well-known pastors. Uh, I'm going to contribute to the uh, betterment of us by not saying anything. <laughs> Dr. Except for this, except for this, and that is that, as my dad said, if you want to kill all the elm trees, it's okay with him. Oh, the so. elm trees? Oh, elm trees are okay. Elm trees. <laughs> All right, so uh, I do have an announcement about upcoming board meetings. The next Board of Education will be held Wednesday, March 7th, here at 5 p.m., and the next Special Education Board meeting will be Monday, February 26th, 7.30 p.m. And we do have an executive session here, guys, in case you didn't look at the last page. We were hoping it was uh, taken yeah. out. So, do I have a motion that the APS Board of Education will convene the executive session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act and NMSA 1978, Article 1015.1H7 for the purpose of discussing matters pertaining to pen pending litigation and attorney client privilege related to Higgins versus GAL for BP, a minor child versus APS et al., uh, CIV 17 rb slice LF. It's a discussion as to it. So I'd have a motion. Uh, for, do I have a second? Second. And please have a roll call, please. Peggy Mueller Armando? Yes. Elizabeth Garcia? Yes. Yolanda Montoya Cordova? Yes. Barbara Peterson? Yes. Candelaria Patterson? Yes. Elizabeth Armijo? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Really? David Pierce. Really? <laughs> Uh, yes. You don't have to. Uh, so we will uh, uh, reside to the DeLeo Martin conference room. <laughs> oh, gosh. oh my gosh. Oh, look, what is it, quarter to nine? It's five till nine. I did. Uh -huh. I don't know what.